Chapter 15 The worst might be over, he hoped. Louise groaned as he tried in vain to find a more comfortable position in the lumpy bed. How long had it been since he'd been this sick? Maybe ten years? Yes, after working back-to-back -back shifts in the ER during the island flu epidemic, subsisting on snack foods grabbed on the fly and relying on adrenaline to keep him going, he'd succumbed himself. He'd felt so bad he'd wanted to die. This bout had been a close second. Whatever virus BJ had passed on to him was wicked, or else it had hit him harder because he was in his 40s instead of his 30s. A decade could make a difference in how a person's body reacted to illness, as could stress and grief. On a positive note, however, his fever was gone. He twisted his head toward the nightstand and reached for the glass of water. Empty. Again. He exhaled. That meant he had to get up if he wanted more, and he needed fluids. His gaze lingered on Elena's photo. She would have taken care of him if she were here. Her nurturing heart had always gone out to those in need, especially family members. Throat clogging, he swung his feet to the floor. It served no purpose to belabor what was lost, and dwelling on the past was dangerous. It might tempt him to take another walk to the cliff. Not today, though. He could barely totter to the bathroom, let alone hike to the other side of town. And with his motorbike parked at John's house, he was stuck here for now. Down the road, however, the cliff was still a possibility. He stood, groping for the chair to steady himself. Once his shaky legs stabilized, he dragged himself toward the sink, refilled his glass, and downed the water in several long gulps. Better. Now he needed to eat. He took a quick inventory of the lean pickings in his small refrigerator. Three eggs, some cheese, apples, leftover quiche from a dish John had made a couple of days ago. Nothing appealed, nor did the tomato soup or can of beans in the pantry whet his appetite. What he wouldn't give for a bowl of Elena's a sopo crio de pollo. He closed his eyes, calling up the taste of the rich gumbo, the sauce redolent of green peppers and garlic, the tangy smoked ham adding a burst of extra flavor to the chicken. His stomach rumbled in misguided anticipation, but it would have to settle for John's offering. Quiche might not be a traditional dish from his homeland, but the man was a first-rate cook, and it would be a shame to waste the... A knock sounded, and he arched an eyebrow. Only one person had ever visited him here, and there was no reason for Eric to return. He trudged to the window beside the door and cracked the blinds. Huh. It was Eric, holding a large brown bag and a six-pack of the Coke he always chose at John's if someone offered him a drink. Scrubbing a hand down his unshaven face, he unlocked the door and pulled it open. The other man gave him a quick head to toe. How you feeling? Not too bad. He waved a hand to the room behind him. I would ask you in, but I do not want my germs to catch you. I've already been exposed. I stopped by BJ's house last night. She's doing better? Yes. Eric held out the bag. With your motorbike at my dad's, I assumed you were stranded out here and might need a few provisions. The man had made a special trip out here to deliver food? His vision misted. You did not have to go to such trouble. It was no trouble, and everyone contributed. Dad sent along part of today's breakfast casserole and some orange juice for tomorrow morning. Stone threw in a few of the granola bars he said you like. I ran by Eleanor's at BJ's request, and when I told her you were sick, she added some fudge cake. My last stop was the cafe. Soup was a hit last night with your boss, so I figured you might like some too. They didn't have chicken noodle today, but the turkey rice sounded like an acceptable alternative. He took the bag. You are all very kind. I told you, this is how things work in Hope Harbor. You have friends here, Luis. Some you've met and a lot more you haven't. Give the town a chance. You won't be sorry. Eric laid a hand on his shoulder. He froze. 
Since the day he'd lost Elena, no one had touched him with warmth or friendship or caring. Amazing how a simple physical connection could help steady a world. I will try. He choked out the words. You won't be sorry. Eric tapped the edge of the bag. The soup's hot, so I won't keep you from it. Do you need anything else before I leave? Would you like me to pick up your mail? Mail? There would be two days' worth in the small box by now. But he never got much, and most of it would be advertisements that could wait until tomorrow. It is fine. I cannot ask you to do more. You didn't ask. I offered. Are the boxes down by the office? Yes, he hesitated. If Eric was willing, why not let him retrieve it? The walk wasn't far, but even if he waited until tomorrow, he might not have the energy to make it. Let me get the key. He retreated to the small counter next to the sink, deposited the bag, and took the key off the peg. Back at the door, he held it out. Box five. Got it. I'll be right back. Luis leaned against the frame while he waited. He needed to sit or lie down fast. Just the simple back and forth in the tiny apartment had worn him out. First, though, he'd have some of the soup Eric had brought. The man returned faster than he'd expected, clutching a handful of mail that included a bulky envelope. I'm glad I checked. The box was crammed. I had to yank to get the big envelope out. He handed it over. A touch of curiosity in Eric's expression put him on alert, and he examined the package. The return address said Central Community College. Louise frowned. This had to be a mistake. He'd had no contact with any college, Yet it was addressed to him, and the envelope was emblazoned with the words, Requested Material. This is strange, he hefted the bulky packet. I did not ask them to send me anything. Could be a mistake, I guess. Odd that they had your name and address, though. Very. While he puzzled over the peculiar parcel, Eric checked his watch. I need to run. I'm meeting BJ at the scene shop tonight to work on sets for the show. She says she feels better, but I want to get there first or she'll tackle the heavy stuff without me. And I doubt she's got the energy for that. Yes, she pushes on herself too hard. Thank you again for the food. No problem. Take care and let me know if you need anything else. He lifted a hand in farewell and jogged back to his car. Luis waited until the BMW picked up speed, then closed the door. Curious as he was about the contents of the envelope, he needed food first. Once he stowed the breakfast casserole and juice in the fridge, he took the soup to the small cafe table and dived in. Halfway through, as his energy began to rebound, he opened the envelope from the college and tipped the contents onto the table. Information about the school's emergency medical services program spilled out. What in the world? He fingered the brochures. Who could have asked the college to send him this? The list of potential candidates was small. He told only John, Stone, BJ, and Father Murphy about his medical background. Perhaps Eric knew too, now that he and BJ had become friends. But the man had appeared to be as surprised by the envelope as he was. Besides, none of those people were the type to resort to clandestine suggestions. He continued to sip his soup skimming through the material while he ate. His English reading vocabulary was limited, but he could pick up the gist. And as he read, a tingle of excitement zipped through him. Being an EMT or paramedic wasn't what he'd hoped for in America. But given the certification hurdles Cuban doctors faced, there was no chance he'd ever practice medicine here. As a paramedic, though, he'd be able to use the skills he'd spent years honing. His enthusiasm continued to build until he got to the sheet detailing the cost. The instant the numbers registered, his budding hope withered. While the sum wasn't astronomical, it was more than he would be able to accumulate. What extra funds he had went back to Cuba. Even if the time came when Elena's father didn't need the money, he had to work full time to pay his living expenses. He couldn't afford the time or money to be a student. Spirit sinking.
Louise gathered up the material and slid it back in the envelope. Why would someone send him this when he didn't have the funds to take advantage of the program? The whole thing was beginning to feel like a cruel prank. He pushed himself to his feet, picked up the envelope, and walked over to the trash can next to the counter. Grasping the lid, he glanced at the bag of food sent by Hope Harbor residents and delivered by a man he'd initially thought might be an enemy. He'd been wrong about Eric. Instead of ruining what was left of his life, John's son had saved it and seemed committed to watching over him and bolstering his spirits. Give the town a chance, he'd advise today. And on Sunday, here in this room, he'd promised life would get better, had suggested Hope Harbor would live up to its name. Louise fingered the envelope. Perhaps Eric was right about this town. In time, it was possible he'd make friends, build a new life, find, if not happiness, at least a sense of peace. But putting his medical skills into practice, that was too much to hope for. He lifted the lid of the trash can and positioned the bulky envelope over it. Let it go, Louise. This is a dream that can never come true. Sensible advice. Yet try as he might, he couldn't unclench his fingers from around the envelope. For a full 30 seconds, he vacillated. But in the end, much to his disgust, he gave up and retracted his hand. Keeping the material was foolish. It would be a continual source of heartache. And of hope, Luis. Don't forget hope. No. He shook his head to dislodge that idea. This wasn't an outcome he could allow himself to wish for. It was possible whoever had requested the college to send the material had good intentions. But it was like dangling a lifeline inches away from the grasp of a drowning man. It tantalized, built up hope, but it didn't change the end result. Luis opened the door of a bottom cabinet he never used and tucked the envelope out of sight. One day soon, he'd throw it away. But not just yet. Wow. BJ came to a dead stop in the doorway of the scene shop. The backdrop was done, and it was spectacular. All the elements Eric had sketched out leapt from the canvas in life-size living color. The finished product was even more striking than she'd anticipated. What do you think? He emerged from behind the farmhouse set, wiping his hands on a rag. I think you missed your calling. She approached the flat slowly, soaking up the pastoral peace of the scene and his touches of whimsy. I can almost feel the breeze, smell the fresh air. You've captured the oh, what a beautiful morning mood perfectly. She stopped 15 feet away and propped her hands on her hips. The audience is gonna love it. He grinned and tossed the rag onto a folding chair. I have to admit, it turned out better than I expected. I have a few finishing touches to add, but I can wrap it up in an hour or two tomorrow. Tonight, let's work on the smokehouse, assuming you're game for that. Game or not, the clock's ticking, but I do feel better. Staying home today helped. She angled toward him. I called Luis before I came and told him to do the same tomorrow. He said you dropped off some food. I was very thoughtful. He shrugged off her compliment. He doesn't have anyone else, and I still feel bad about jumping all over him the first day. So, if you're ready to direct me, I'm ready to wield a hammer and saw. A man who didn't like to dwell on his good deeds. Another check mark in his positive column. I'm not an invalid. I can do my share. She started forward, only to have Eric snag her arm as she tried to pass. Let me do most of the heavy lifting tonight, okay? If you're planning to put in a full day at the house tomorrow, wearing yourself out tonight could jinx that. He was right, again. Fine, I'll direct and do some of the less strenuous tasks. Let's get rolling. For the next hour, the sound of hammering and sawing filled the scene shop. Eric took direction well, and with both of them working, they made significant progress. One more night like this, and she'd have only a few final details to deal with on Saturday. 
However, despite the fact that Eric was doing the bulk of the manual labor, she was beginning to fade. Ready for a soda? He descended the ladder, set his hammer on one of the rungs, and scrutinized her. Or, on second thought, why don't we call it a night? You've lost some color. I'm fine, but I won't veto a short break. He hesitated, as if debating whether to push for an early evening, then capitulated. I'll run over to the vending machine and... Welcome home, stranger. At the female voice, they both turned. Lexi Graham stood silhouetted in the doorway, the setting sun adding a luster to her dark hair. Even the genderless police uniform couldn't disguise her womanly curves. BJ sneaked a peek at Eric. Based on the appreciative perusal he was giving the new arrival, he'd noticed her attributes. Hey, Lexi. He gave her a warm, welcoming smile. What brings you here? I heard you were working on the backdrop for the show. I was passing by on patrol and decided to drop in and say hello since you haven't bothered to come by the station. She strolled toward them. I've been busy. I can see that. The woman's lips twitched, and BJ shifted her weight as Lexi flicked her a glance. Anyway, it's nice to have you back. She crossed to Eric and gave him a hug, which she returned with enthusiasm. A strange little twinge of some nebulous emotion rippled through BJ. Could it be jealousy? Know each other? She tuned back into the conversation and found Eric watching her, waiting for an answer to his question. Uh, no. That is, we've never met formally. She wiped her palm on her jeans and held out her hand. BJ Stevens, nice to meet you. The woman took her hand in a strong grip. Lexi Graham. Also known as the chief of police. Who'd have guessed that's where you'd end up back in our days of playing cops and robbers as kids? Eric grinned at her. Yeah, funny how our lives can take directions we never expected. A shadow flitted across her eyes so fast, BJ couldn't be certain if it had been real or a mere play of light. I heard about your job. I'm sorry. It happens. Everyone's downsizing these days. The chief cocked her head. You don't seem nearly as bothered about it as I expected. You had your sight set on a law partnership as far back as I can remember. Meaning these two had a long history together. Another piece of bad news. For reasons BJ didn't care to examine. I was a lot more upset a week ago. But Hope Harbor is a way of restoring perspective. No argument there. She rested her hand on the pistol on her belt and scanned the backdrop. Nice work. But you always did have artistic talent. I thought you might end up doing more with it. I needed to pay the bills. I hear ya. Well, I don't want to hold up your progress. Back to patrol for me. Can't police chiefs delegate that duty? Not in a small town. Our department is lean, and if one officer is out, guess who fills in? But I don't mind. Keeps me in touch with the street. Nice to meet you, BJ. Thanks, you too. Eric watched the chief stroll out, then turned back to her. Where were we? Soda. Right, give me a minute. While he was gone, BJ set up two folding chairs and sank into one. No way was she going to admit she was more than ready to cave, especially after the appearance of the dynamic chief who radiated vim and vigor. Maybe the soda would give her a burst of energy. Plus, she could use the break to ask a few questions about the ringless woman who knew Eric very well. Yeah, yeah, she'd notice the bare fourth finger on her left hand. What woman wouldn't if she was with a guy who could set off bells and whistles without trying, even if he was off limits? It was a normal female reaction that meant nothing. Liar, liar, she thought to herself. A diet sprite for the lady. Squelching the annoying voice in her head, she reached for the ice-cold soda he held out. Thanks. She popped the tab and took a long swallow. I'm surprised you haven't become acquainted with Lexi. The perfect opening. 
I don't see her around town much when she's off duty, and I haven't broken any laws to attract her attention on duty, unlike someone I know. Ha ha. It's not too late to report your cell phone transgression to the chief, but I have a feeling she'd let you off. Smirking, he swirled his can. She might. We have a history. That was what she'd been afraid of. I take it you've known her your whole life? Yep. Comes with living in a small town. How come you two haven't gotten acquainted? Don't you see her at church? No. I thought she might go to St. Francis. Not when we were kids. His expression grew pensive. I wonder if she stopped going after she got back from the Middle East. BJ blinked. She was in the Middle East? Yeah, a diplomatic security job with the State Department. Apparently, she had a rough stretch at the end. According to town scuttlebutt, she got married over there, only to have her husband killed a few weeks later in an attack that left her with some serious injuries. She came back here three years ago with a baby in tow. So Lexi was a widow with a young child and a traumatic past. I wonder if that's why she keeps to herself. Could be. But back in the day, she was the outgoing life of the party type. We had some happy times as kids. In fact, she was my date for the senior prom. Her stomach nodded. But he didn't go to see her after he got back, BJ. She had to look him up. That means there aren't any lingering feelings on his part, she thought. Or maybe he simply hadn't gotten around to dropping by the station yet. And there was no reason they couldn't pick up where they'd left off. The chief appeared to be open to the idea. Why else would she seek him out? And it was obvious Eric liked her. Her spirits nosedived. Of their prom date, don't you think? Uh-oh, she'd lost the thread of the conversation. Uh, sorry, what? She wrapped both hands around her soda. I said most people have fond memories of their date for the senior prom, don't you think? A sore subject, and not one she wanted to discuss. I don't know. She drained the can and stood. Ready to go back to work? He rose slowly, searching her with that intent, probing look of his, the one that seemed capable of delving deep into her soul. She snatched his empty can. I'll get rid of these in the cafeteria. He grabbed her arm before she could flee. You didn't go to the prom, did you? Pressure built in her throat at his soft, sympathetic question, and her vision blurred. Good grief, how stupid was this? She was over the prom debacle, had been for years. Why in heaven's name would she get weepy about some dumb dance for teenagers? BJ. At his soft summons, she lifted her lashes. His eyes were gentle, caring, encouraging. Answer the man's question, BJ. Just spit it out and be done with it. It's old news, she thought to herself. N no. The word came out shaky and she swallowed. A friend set me up with her cousin, but he called that afternoon and canceled. He said he was sick. Said he was sick? A flash of anger hardened his eyes. I saw him the next day in town with some buddies. She gave a stiff shrug. He just didn't want to go with the fat girl. No one did. Let me ditch these and we can get back to work. She pulled free of his grasp and dashed toward the doorway, praying he wouldn't follow. He didn't. Once she reached the privacy of the hall, she slumped against the hard concrete block wall, tears streaming down her cheeks. Why should a discussion about ancient history set off a deluge of tears, and why hadn't she left her answer at a simple no instead of sharing the whole humiliating explanation? It made no sense. And now she had to go back in and face Eric. Dread congealed in her stomach. But hiding in the hall wasn't going to change reality. And they had a set to finish. Straightening up, BJ lifted her chin and continued toward the cafeteria to dispose of the empty cans. She'd get her unruly emotions under control, wipe away her tears, and shore up her defenses. 
because after that dramatic exit, she had a feeling Eric might ask a lot more questions. And if those warm brown eyes of his could coax her to share the story of her disastrous prom date, it was very possible they could also tempt her to reveal the much more recent and far more crushing episode that had been the catalyst for her flight from L.A. And if a discussion about the prom could induce tears, talking about L.A. might trigger a complete meltdown. On the other hand, it could be healing and liberating. Sighing, she tossed the cans in the recycle bin. Who knew how this might play out? Maybe Eric would make it easy and drop the subject. But if he didn't, she'd just have to follow her heart and hope for the best. Chapter 16 Great job, Nash. Making the lady cry is going to earn you a whole lot of brownie points, he thought. Gut twisting, Eric stared at the doorway BJ had fled through moments ago. He shouldn't have pushed about the prom. Shouldn't have pressed her to tell him the painful, humiliating story. The whole high school social event of the year scene might not have been a big deal for him, but stuff like that meant a lot to most girls, especially ones who didn't go on a lot of dates or have a steady boyfriend like BJ. Inhaling a lungful of the fresh paint and sawdust-laden air, he began to pace. Could he have been any more insensitive? She'd probably spent hours shopping for a dress, maybe gotten her hair done, had a manicure, purchased new makeup, and spent hours practicing with it. Then that low life had ruined her magical night. She must have been devastated. And still was, based on the shimmer of tears he'd spotted while she'd relayed the sad story in a few choppy, stilted sentences before fleeing. If only he could replay that last scene, change the ending. But this was real life, not theater. He couldn't rewrite the script. His only recourse was damage control, assuming he could come up with a plan. Unfortunately, she'd return before he'd gotten past the first step. Ready to get back to work? She stopped several feet away, her too bright smile at odds with the shadows lurking in her eyes. Yes, but first, I, I want to apologize. Step one accomplished. He'd have to wing the rest. Her fake smile seemed as painted on as the images filling the backdrop behind her. Not necessary. I overreacted. Who cares about what happened 16 years ago? You do did. I think you still do, and so do I. Her smile wavered. I appreciate that, but one teenage disappointment doesn't make or break a life. It can leave scars, though. He moved closer, halting when she tensed. Can I say something? I don't know. A hint of panic wove through her words, and she wrapped her arms around herself. His throat tightened at the protective move. She seemed so alone, standing there trying to be brave. So in need of a warm, comforting hug. A soft caress. A gentle touch. Some gesture that would compensate even in a small way for the unkindness she'd endured at the hands of that high school punk. And the jerk who'd hurt her more recently. If most of her experiences with the opposite sex had been of the same unpleasant ilk, it was no wonder she was single. He jammed his hands in his pockets before the temptation to wrap her in his arms became too strong to resist. I'm gonna say it anyway. He locked gazes with her. I'm getting the impression you haven't had the best experiences in the romance department. And I'm sorry for that. More than I can say. It sounds like you've crossed paths with some real losers. But not all guys are like that. I know. Her reply came out in a choked whisper. Theoretically speaking. He digested her caveat and came to the obvious conclusion. BJ had never had a pleasant dating experience. In fact, if she'd been heavy most of her life, she may have had very few dating experiences, period. Based on what he'd observed, her earlier comment was true. B 
being plump could put a serious crimp in romance. A lot of guys wouldn't think of asking out someone who was seriously overweight, no matter how nice or smart or kind they might be, including him. A wave of guilt washed over him. He'd never considered himself to be prejudiced or shallow, but it appeared bigotry could take many forms. He drew a steadying breath. Are you telling me you've never dated a nice guy? The knuckles gripping her upper arms whitened. It doesn't matter. It does to me. Why? Good question. He took his time answering, choosing his words with care. Because I like you. A lot. And it bothers me that no one else of my gender has recognized how special you are. Her eyes widened, then just as quickly shuddered. The wry twist of her lips that followed didn't come close to qualifying as a smile. That's a great line. Line? He clamped his jaw shut, trying to keep his anger and hurt in check. Didn't she know him well enough by now to realize he wasn't feeding her a... Wait. The left side of his brain kicked in as he weighed her comment. Why would she say that unless... As he came to the heartbreaking conclusion, he swallowed past the sudden pressure in his throat, his aggravation evaporating. That wasn't a line, BJ. I meant every word. But someone less sincere told you the same thing once, didn't he? Her nostrils flared and she glowered at him in silence. Okay, this discussion was over. But he knew the answer and he wanted to comfort, to reassure, to ease some of her. His name was Todd. He did a double take at the unexpected revelation, and some quick recalibrating. Her anger had been directed at the jerk, not him. Plus, she'd cracked the door to a discussion, and he needed to respond in exactly the right way, or she'd slam it shut in his face. Letting his instincts take over, he crossed to her in three long strides, reached for her cold hand, and twined his fingers with hers. I've never been in a fist fight in my life. But if he was here right now, I'd punch him out. A beat passed as BJ scrutinized him. Two, three. Then some of her stiffness dissolved. I don't like violence as a rule, but thank you. You're welcome. He motioned to the chairs. Wanna sit for a few more minutes? She hesitated. What about the set? It's coming along. The rest can wait until tomorrow. He could read the conflict in her eyes, but pushing wouldn't be wise. If she chose to confide in him, the decision had to be freely made, not coerced. Besides, his behavior since they'd met was a better endorsement of his character than words. Second after eternal second dragged by. But in the end, she nodded. Okay. The knot in his stomach loosened. Thank you, God. Keeping a firm hold on her fingers, he led her back to the chairs, angling his toward her. Their knees were almost touching after he sat. He waited, letting her set the pace and timing for whatever she was willing to share. Half a minute ticked by while she picked at a speck of glue on her jeans swallowed, towed some wood shavings on the floor. You know, she peeked over at him. Out in the hall, I was afraid this might happen. What? That I'd cave and spill my guts about L.A. Would that be bad? She lifted one shoulder. Sharing confidences can create bonds, I don't want to start having feelings for a man who won't be around long. He was tempted to deny her assumptions about his plans, but that would be misleading. At this point, he had no idea what his future held, and they'd promised to be honest with each other. Better to respond with a question. What happened to change your mind? You. She homed in on their linked hands. You have this ability to... Make me feel as if you really care. I do. Why? Puzzlement etched her features. Two weeks ago, you didn't even know I existed. 
I've been asking myself that same question. All I can come up with is that something clicked between us from the beginning. And I'd like to get to know you a lot better. She looked down again at their clasped hands. Todd said almost the same thing on our first date. He grimaced. That's not the best news I've ever heard. If it makes you feel any better, besides the fact you both drive BMWs and fall into the tall, dark, and handsome camp, there aren't a lot of other similarities. That helps a little. Where did you meet this guy? In L.A., not quite two years ago. Soon after her grandmother died, when she would have been emotionally wrung out and susceptible to a smooth talker. A muscle twitched in his cheek. The guy was worse than a jerk. He was a... Eric squelched a word that would have shocked his mother, even if it was accurate. I take it he wasn't the man you thought he was. That would be a kind way of putting it. She leaned back in her chair, tugging her fingers free. He let them go but missed the connection at once. How did you meet? At a professional dinner. He's an architect, too, with a much larger firm than the one where I worked. I'd won a prestigious award for one of my designs, and he came over after the meal to congratulate me. When he called a few days later to ask me out, I couldn't believe it. He was attractive, personable, suave. In other words, miles out of my league, you're selling yourself short. No, telling the truth. I'd just reached my ideal weight and was still trying to work up the courage to enter the dating scene. I had zero experience with men and even less confidence. But the timing seemed almost like destiny. I was lonely, missing Graham, wondering if I'd ever meet anyone who might be the one when out of the blue he appeared. It seemed too good to be true. And as it turned out, it was. All at once, Eric had a feeling he knew where this was heading, and it wasn't sitting well. Did he take advantage of you? He forced the question past gritted teeth, the folding chair squeaking beneath him as he leaned forward. Her mouth twisted again. Not in the way you mean. He wasn't after that. He had far more ambitious goals. Not the answer he'd expected. What do you mean? She laced her fingers together in her lap. He was new in town and new at his firm. He'd been recruited from a mid-sized company in the Midwest. Todd had great ambition, and with his glib tongue, he managed to grab the coveted opening. But as I later discovered, he had more charm than talent. Meaning he got in over his head? Big time. She brushed back some soft wisps of hair that had escaped her braid, distress sharpening the angles of her face. If I hadn't been smitten, I would have seen the red flags. After softening me up with a couple of very nice evenings out, he said he preferred quiet, private dinners to noisy restaurants and began coming over to my condo with takeout. I always brought work home, and he was very interested in my projects. His attention and questions fed my ego and kept him supplied with the innovative design concepts he couldn't come up with on his own. Are you saying he stole your ideas? Shock rippled through him. Yes, but I didn't catch on to his scheme for months. Not until my firm was asked to bid on a high-profile job. It was a huge opportunity for us. We were more of a boutique house, and this would have significantly raised our visibility. My boss, the owner, was super excited. We all worked our tails off. As I discovered later, Todd's firm was on the bid list too, and Todd was the lead person on the project. Night after night, I talked to him about our design over those cozy dinners at my place, and he borrowed all the elements he liked. Outrage kicked his pulse up another notch. But, but that's unethical not to mention illegal. There are intellectual property rights at stake and copyright infringement issues. Your firm could have sued him. The design his firm presented wasn't an exact copy of ours. Doesn't matter. In a case like that, infringement is based on the presence of substantial similarities. 
Plus, you'd have had no problem proving he had access to your plans and specifications. I know. That's what our firm's attorney said after I told my boss what happened. But she also warned that we could be dealing with a long, expensive court battle. In the end, my boss decided to cut his losses and let it go. I assume you figured out Todd's role once you learned you got the job. Yes. After our presentation, the client called my boss to tell him they were going with Todd's firm. That while our ideas were strikingly similar, they felt more comfortable using a larger, more established company. When my boss gathered us together in the conference room to give us the bad news, I almost threw up. Did you contact Todd? The minute the meeting ended. He didn't admit to stealing, just made some flippant comment about great minds thinking alike. I hung up on him, went to the ladies' room, and lost my lunch. It was all revoltingly obvious in hindsight. I had won awards for my innovative designs, and he needed ideas. He looked me over, deduced I was easy prey, and launched his campaign. He used me and I was too naive and gullible to realize I was being duped. Needless to say, my shaky self-esteem went straight down the toilet with my lunch. Did you get fired because of this? Eric narrowed his eyes. No, considering the whole mess was my fault, my boss was very gracious. But I'd been rethinking my priorities anyway. After Graham died, the lore of making a name for myself as a big city architect faded. I'd visited Tracy here and liked Hope Harbor, so I decided to make a fresh start and aim for a better quality of life. Did you ever hear from Todd after your phone call? Yes. He sent me an expensive bracelet and a note a few days later inviting me to dinner to, in his words, smooth out the waters. As if money could fix the problem. Disgust flattened her mouth. Almost the same words she'd used after his cavalier comment about insurance the day of their fender bender. Given her history, no wonder she'd been ticked off by his dismissive attitude. What did you do with the bracelet? I sold it on eBay and donated the proceeds to Helping Hands after I got here. I liked that the gift ended up benefiting a worthy cause. Have you ever had any regrets about upending your life and changing direction? The tension melted from her features. Not a one. I love my life here. I like the work, the people, the pace. The circumstances that led me to this decision might not have been pleasant, but I do see God's hand in the outcome. This is where I was meant to be. Her conviction was indisputable. I'm sorry for all you went through, with Todd and the guy in high school, not to mention your grandmother's illness. But I envy your contentment and your certainty about your place in the world. I thought you were certain about yours, too. So did I. The chair squeaked again as he shifted position. But everything's been topsy-turvy since I got home. Maybe you just need some time to unwind from that high-stress job of yours. Maybe. A yawn snuck up on her, and she clapped a hand over her mouth. Sorry. Don't be. We ought to close up shop so you can go home and get some rest. You must be exhausted. You know, it's kind of weird. I always assumed sharing that story would be draining, but I actually feel better. At least one of them did. Sometimes talking things through can help clarify and add perspective. Assuming you do it with the right person, and I did. She stifled another yawn, inched her chair back, and stood. If you'll get the lights, I'll grab my tools and meet you at the door. She hurried toward the smokehouse without giving him a chance to respond. He rose more slowly and wandered toward the door. When she joined him 30 seconds later, he was still trying to sort through everything she'd told him, his own feelings, and the ramifications of both. After locking up, she scanned the western sky, where banks of clouds were massing on the horizon. I have a feeling we're in for a beautiful sunset. Yeah. And any other time, he'd like nothing more than to share it with the woman beside him, 
sitting on a cozy bench on the wharf, boats bobbing in the foreground, Floyd and Gladys pecking at scraps of food around their feet. But not tonight. She might have found her confession cathartic, but it had left him with a myriad of disconcerting emotions and questions. You seem deep in thought. She looked over as they strolled toward their vehicles. You gave me a lot to think about. Too much? No. His reply was immediate and emphatic. He did not want her to regret bearing her heart. But it makes me feel guilty. I haven't faced nearly as many challenges as you and people like Luis have. Don't even put me in the same category as Luis. Next to what he's gone through, my life's been a cakewalk. She stopped beside her car. Thanks for listening tonight. Thanks for trusting me with the story. There was nothing more to say. But walking away with a casual, see you around, didn't feel right either. Not after she'd shared so many intimate details about her life. Would she be receptive to what his instincts were urging him to do? Only one way to find out. He conjured up a smile. You know, after our little hand-holding session in the scene shop, don't you think we ought to say goodbye with a hug? She crossed her arms. Not a positive sign. Like the one you gave the chief? He squinted at her. What did Lexi have to do with this? Unless, oh, did BJ think he had feelings for the chief? Better clear that up, pronto. You mean the one she gave me? It looked pretty consensual to me. Her teasing inflection sounded forced. Let me set the record straight. My high school crush on Lexi ended long ago. She's a great gal, but our lives went very different directions. I expect we'll always be friends, but that's it. So, about that hug. She slowly uncrossed her arms. I guess that would be okay. As long as it's a just friends hug. No, I'm good with that. For now. Scrubbing her hands on her thighs, she stepped toward him. He met her halfway. Keep it simple, supportive, straightforward, he thought. He let that mantra loop through his mind. But when she lifted her chin to look up at him, the air whooshed out of his lungs. Her jade irises, that faint sprinkling of freckles across her nose, the graceful curve of her cheek, those lush, perfectly shaped lips. Her breath hitched. Uh-oh. She must have realized he didn't have friendship on his mind. Watch it, Nash, or you're gonna blow this. Before she could back off, he pulled her into his arms. She stiffened, but when he did nothing more than hold her, she began to relax, her soft curves melting against him. He gave her a tentative squeeze, and she squeezed back, the silky strands of hair that had worked free of her soft braid brushing his jaw. She felt perfect in his arms, so perfect he wished he could hold her for hours, until the sun set over the sea and stars lit the night sky. But the instant she made a move to pull back, he let her go. Well... Her respiration seemed as ragged as his while she groped for her keys, dropped them. He bent to retrieve them, but she beat him. After scooping them up, she turned aside to open the truck door, hiding her face from his view. I'll see you tomorrow, I guess. Count on it. I can pick up Luis in the morning if he's planning to come to work. He is, but you've done enough. I'll swing by and get him. She put on a pair of sunglasses she didn't need and climbed behind the wheel. He waited while she put the truck in gear and pulled away with a final wave, then meandered back to his car. If BJ had felt so right in his arms during a mere hug, what would it be like to... No, he'd promised her friendship and he'd keep that promise. 
Unless both of them decided to venture into deeper waters, no matter the compromises that might entail. However, he, for one, wasn't there yet. Keys in hand, he slid behind the wheel of the BMW. It was possible BJ might be thinking about exploring more than friendship, too. But even if she gave him the green light, he needed to make some decisions about his future before he got in too deep. He was not gonna hurt this woman who'd already endured more than her share of trauma. She didn't need another broken romance, and he didn't need a broken heart. Which was exactly what he'd get if he let himself fall for the lovely architect, only to leave Hope Harbor and her behind in the end. Chapter 17 Oh my word! This was where Luis lived? BJ gaped at the dilapidated motel-turned-apartment complex, her stomach roiling as she maneuvered around a rut in the crumbling asphalt drive. No one had told her the place was a dump, and she'd had no occasion to drive down this road. The well-maintained sign on 101 certainly offered no hint of the disrepair beyond. They ought to change the name from Sea Haven to Sea Hovel, why in heaven's name hadn't the town or the county condemned this place long ago? And why had Luis chosen to live here? She paid him enough to afford better accommodations. Except if he upgraded his lodgings, he wouldn't be able to send as much money back to Cuba. Of course, he'd apply the frugal rationale that guided his choices on all necessities. Food, transportation, clothing, to his living quarters too but this wasn't right. Scanning the faded numbers on the doors, she spotted Unit 5 just as Luis emerged. He lifted a hand in greeting, twisted the key in the lock, and crossed to the truck. Thank you for picking me up. He slid in and buckled up. No problem. How you feeling? Much better. That might be true, but he looked as if he'd lost ten shades of color and several pounds while battling the nasty bug. If you need another day to recuperate, that's not a problem. I don't dock employees for being sick. I will be fine. I am stronger today, and I do not take money for work I have not done. The very opening she needed. Louise, her fingers contracted on the wheel. Be careful, BJ. Don't offend him. Look, this is my first visit here. She swept a hand down the length of the apartment units. It isn't a, uh, great place. It is okay. The door has a lock and the roof does not leak. He flashed her a quick, dismissive smile. This was gonna be a tough sell. I understand the need to have lower expectations in a new country, and I know money can be tight when you're starting over, but government assistance is available to Cuban immigrants. Why don't you apply for some, just until you get your feet under you? He was shaking his head even before she finished. No. America, she has given me safeness and freedom. It is enough. I cannot take more. The same thing he told Father Kevin, almost verbatim, based on the conversation the St. Francis priest had shared with her. I admire your attitude, but it wouldn't be forever, and other refugees take the aid. That is their choice. How is the work going? Subject closed. If she was gonna win this argument, she'd have to come up with another strategy. BJ put the truck back in gear, and as they trundled over the rough pavement toward 101, she filled him in on what had taken place at the job site in his absence. But she wasn't letting this go. If the decaying apartment complex was half as bad on the inside as it was on the outside, the place wasn't fit for human habitation, and she had a feeling it might be worse. At least she had a source for that information. Eric had surely been inside or gotten a peek during one of his visits. At the first opportunity, she'd corner him and ask some questions. And if the accommodations were as bad as she expected, she was going to get Luis out of here. Fast. Whatever it took. 
because a man who'd left everything he knew behind, who'd endured a harrowing sea voyage, who'd watched the woman he loved die a tragic death, and who'd traded his skilled career as a doctor for a life of freedom as a carpenter, deserved, at the very least, a decent place to rest his head at night. It was still here. Eric gripped the easel, gave it a yank, and released a cloud of dust from the pile of stuff stacked under the basement stairs. A sneeze tickled his nose, and he waved a hand in front of his face to clear the air. Obviously, his dad hadn't rummaged around down here in a while. He braced the pile with one hand and tugged the easel again with the other. It came out on his second attempt along with a bunch of other junk that clattered to the floor. Muttering a few choice words, Eric propped the easel against the wall and began to gather up the old TV trays, unmarked boxes sealed shut with yellowed tape, and almost empty paint cans. Everything okay down there? As his father's voice echoed down the stairs, he accelerated his pace. Fine, I'll be up in a minute. You need some help? His father began to descend the stairs. I've got it. A thread of desperation wove through his reply. Another set of hands can't hurt. His father clumped closer. He picked up the last TV tray and shoved it into place as his father rounded the bottom of the stairs. You were making as much commotion as my rehab crew. His dad swatted at the dust motes floating through the air. Guess I ought to clean up down here every year or two. <laughs> Couldn't hurt. Eric shifted in front of the easel and leaned against the steps. What were you looking for? Nothing. I was, uh, poking around. Not a lie. He hadn't been looking for the easel. He'd known exactly where he'd left it. Oh, his father leaned sideways. I thought you might be pulling your easel out of mothballs. So much for his clandestine mission. He'd never been able to get anything past his father as a kid. Why should that change now? Okay, guilty as charged. He turned and pulled out the dusty easel. I wasn't certain it would still be here. No reason to move it or get rid of it. I always hoped you'd take up painting again one day. Listen, Dad, it was important to be clear about his intentions up front. I'm just fooling around with this while I'm here. Don't get the wrong idea. Which would be that I'm gonna start painting again. You're already doing that at the high school. A one-time project is different. This kind of painting, he tapped the easel, is more serious. It doesn't have to be. Some people paint for fun, as a hobby. I don't have time for hobbies. When I leave Hope Harbor, the easel will stay here. Doing that backdrop simply gave me the itch to work on a real painting, that's all. Besides, what's wrong with being serious about painting? Eric narrowed his eyes. Had his dad heard a word he'd said? Painting isn't a reliable occupation. Who said anything about making it an occupation? You can be serious about painting and have another career, too. Not if the other career is the partner track at a law firm. You still set on going back to that? Haven't I said that all along? Yes, but I thought being back in Hope Harbor might change your perspective. That and meeting BJ. His father grinned. You two seem very chummy. Warmth crept up his neck. She's a nice woman, at the very least. She's also building a business here. True. Long-distance relationships are problematic, assuming I was interested. Also true. I wouldn't recommend it, assuming you were interested. He frowned. Then what are you saying? Just throwing out ideas. He eyed the stuff piled in the stairwell. It appears you took care of the landslide down here without me. Guess I'll head back up. Breakfast is ready. Sounds like the whole crew will be here today. You joining us? Yeah, I'll be up in a minute. He waited while his father ascended the stairs, then grabbed a stray rag from a pile in the corner and dusted off the easel, his hands busy cleaning up one mess while his mind wrestled with a bunch of others. 
Why had almost every conversation since he'd arrived home left him with more questions than answers? How had he managed to get himself so involved in the life of this town and the lives of several of its citizens in less than ten days? What was he supposed to do about BJ and his growing feelings for her? Should he let all that had happened on his trip sway him from the path he'd laid out during his senior year of high school? Why, after all these years, were those 60-plus hour weeks beginning to lose their appeal? He wadded up the grimy rag and hurled it back into the corner as the questions strobed across his brain. Flexing his fingers, he forced the taut muscles in his shoulders to relax. Chill, Nash. You're getting too worked up about this. There's no rush here. No lives or major court cases are hanging in the balance. All that was true. He'd allotted himself three weeks of downtime before diving into an intensive job search. And he wasn't even at the halfway point of that. So why not take one day at a time and pray the answers he needed would come? Preferably sooner rather than later. BJ swung the hammer, secured a nail in the smokehouse set, and glanced toward the scene shop door. Again. Of all nights for Eric to be late. Huffing out of breath, she picked up another nail. Ever since her visit to that cruddy apartment complex this morning, she'd been chomping at the bit to talk to him about Luis. How frustrating to sit right across from him at breakfast and have to remain mute on the subject. But with Luis on her left, there'd been no other option. Besides, Eric had seemed distracted. And once the meal wrapped up, he'd disappeared for the entire day, There'd been no opportunity for a discreet discussion. Her only direct communication from him had been a text message telling her he'd be here tonight. But he wasn't. Yet. If he'd been delayed or was going to cancel, why hadn't he... Sorry I'm late. She swiveled around as he pushed through the doorway, relief coursing through her. I was about to give up on you. No excuses. I... Lost track of time this afternoon and got home late for dinner. He picked up the other hammer from the bench and canvassed the set. You've made some progress without me. A little. You must have been seriously distracted if you forgot about dinner. Yeah. What would you like me to tackle here? He didn't want to discuss his day. Fine. She had other subjects to talk about anyway. We're down to the details. I need that stuff over there tacked to the inside walls. The director left a diagram of where it all should go. But first, I have a question. Have you been inside Luis's apartment? Yes, why? He picked up the diagram. Is it as bad inside as it is outside? He hiked up an eyebrow. Haven't you ever been there? No, I've never had a reason to drop by. The outside is awful. Eric's face grew grim. The inside's no better. That's what I was afraid of. She shoved the nail back in the pouch on her tool belt and exhaled. He can't stay there. Are there any other nearby options that offer better value for the price? I doubt it. I called the manager today to ask about the rent. It's dirt cheap, validating the old adage that you get what you pay for. If that's the least expensive housing around, how do you propose we get him to move? I don't know. She began to pace, tapping the hammer against her palm. But he deserves better. Eric set the layout down. Did you discuss this with him? I tried, but he wasn't receptive. He said the place was acceptable. I suggested he apply for government assistance, but that went over like a lead balloon. Do you think Father Kevin might be able to intercede? He's already tried. The problem is, Luis is adamant about not taking anything he views as charity. I have a feeling he won't even let me pay him for the sick days he... Her phone began to vibrate and she pulled it out. Skim the screen. It, give me a minute. She tapped the talk button and walked a few feet away. Hi, Eleanor. Hello, dear. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Nothing that can't wait a few minutes. Eric and I are working on the set for the Helping Hands benefit. How nice. He's a delightful young man. 
We had a nice conversation when he dropped by while you were sick. I gave him some fudge cake, and I sent some to your friend Luis, too. Eric told me he'd caught the same bug you had. I wanted to see how you both were doing. BJ stared at the nest of hungry hatchlings Eric had painted in the willow tree, so in need of loving care, her mind whirring as several seemingly unrelated pieces of information began to connect. Eleanor needed someone to help her with daily chores. Luis needed to escape from the rat hole he called home. They were both alone and lonely. And she needed a test case for helping hands before the board would approve her companion program. It was a heaven-sent opportunity. But could she convince both parties to give it a shot? BJ, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. She tried to tamp down her growing excitement. Luis and I are both much better. How are you doing? Fine. None the worse for wear after my silly tumble. I won't keep you from your work, my dear, or from that fine young man. If you want to stop by in the next day or two, I saved you a piece of fudge cake. Methuselah and I are always happy to see you. I may do that. Wonderful. Take care and stay well until I see you. As Eleanor ended the call, BJ lowered the cell mind racing. Were Eleanor and Luis the solution to her dilemma with helping hands? Or was she grasping at straws? After all, she hadn't envisioned the program catering to their exact situation. Nevertheless, why not? What's up? She angled toward Eric. That was Eleanor. So I gathered. While I was talking to her, I had an idea about my helping hands project. Yeah? He set down his hammer. What is it? She gave him the gist in a few sentences. I mean, it's not exactly the scenario I envisioned. I assumed we'd pair up same-gender companions, but Luis and Eleanor would both benefit from the arrangement, and I can't see why it wouldn't work. What do you think? I think it's a brilliant idea. His smile warmed her all the way to the tips of her toes. The only question is, will they go for it? And will the Helping Hands board consider it a sufficient test case? She began to pace. That's easy enough to check. Right. She tried to keep a lid on her burgeoning hope. Rushing would be a mistake. There were details to work through, documents to draw up, feelers to put out. Maybe I'll corner Reverend Baker on Sunday after church and get a quick read from him before I take this any further. Not a bad idea. And if he's receptive, you could run it past Michael, too. He propped a shoulder against the smokehouse and folded his arms. I don't want to barge in on your party, but if you'd like some moral support for any of those discussions, I'll be happy to provide it. That and whatever legal documents you need to make this happen. I accept on both counts, with thanks. She stopped in front of him. Which reminds me, did you ever manage to contact that former colleague of yours from Coos Bay? We'll need ongoing legal help if this pans out. As a matter of fact, he texted me today. I was gonna let you know after we finished up here tonight. It seems he's too busy with important work to forward a few names of attorneys there who might be willing to help out with your program. Sarcasm scored Eric's words. However, I'm not giving up. I can reach out to some other contacts. Any help is gratefully accepted and appreciated. She laid her hand on his arm. Thank you for everything you've done. All at once, his brown irises darkened and a current of electricity sizzled between them. Mercy. Any second now, he was going to pull her into another one of those delectable hugs. Instead, with an abrupt move, he pushed off from the smokehouse, breaking the connection between them. I think we have a set to finish. Whoops. She must have misread his cues. Right. She circled around him and got back to work. For the rest of the evening, loud hammering eliminated the possibility of extended conversation. But by the time they wound down, the set was done. 
And although her mind had kept wandering to the man working at her side, she'd also managed to put together a mental checklist of all the issues that needed to be addressed before she could launch her test case. I think it's a wrap. Eric drew back a few feet from the smokehouse and sized it up. Is this what you envisioned? Exactly. She began to gather up her tools. And I'm glad it's over, aren't you? When he didn't respond, she looked over at him. To be honest, I kind of enjoyed working on it. I guess that makes sense from your perspective. She went back to collecting her tools. The project did give you a chance to use your artistic talent. True, but that's not the only reason I enjoyed it. She turned back to him, and her pulse stuttered at the appreciative gleam in his eyes. No question about it this time. The man was flirting with her. And if she responded to his cue, if he hugged her goodbye tonight, she had a feeling he'd have a lot more on his mind than a friendly squeeze. Scary thought, despite the delicious tingle that raced down her spine. Playful flirting was one thing. Flirting with danger was another. Remember your rule, BJ. Be cautious and prudent and measured. Your heart's at stake here, she thought to herself. Check. So, I'll meet you at the door, okay? Her words came out shaky. He hesitated for a moment, then nodded. She finished stowing her tools, keeping tabs on him in her peripheral vision. But he simply walked to the exit and waited. Getting to her car without a hug, however, could be tricky if he had a clinch on his mind. And if he did pull her into his arms, she wasn't certain she'd have the willpower to resist. After easing aside to let her proceed him out the door, he pulled it firmly shut behind them and tested the lock. It rattled, but held. Our work is safe and secure. He dropped his hand from the knob. Good, we wouldn't want any scenery stealers to walk off with our masterpieces. She gripped her car keys in her hand and started for her truck, trying with limited success to match his teasing manner. He fell in beside her. The sun had set, and vast swaths of intense color spanned the horizon. It was a beautiful evening. The kind featured in a lot of happy ending type books. The kind that was conducive to hand holding and hugs and romance. Stay strong, BJ, she thought. She picked up her pace. Eric did too. So what does BJ stand for? At the out of the blue question, her step faltered. What? Your initials. What do they stand for? His tone was relaxed, conversational, chit-chatty. It was too dim to detect his expression, but from all indications, he'd switched emotional gears. Um, you won't laugh, will you? Why would I laugh? It's a very southern and old-fashioned name. My mom's choice. But it never fit. It seemed to belong to someone slender and graceful who'd look great wearing a hoop skirt. And that wasn't me. It is now. Thank you for that. However, I hated the name. After I went to live with Graham and Gramps, I asked them to call me BJ instead, and it stuck. Instead of what? He wasn't gonna let her off the hook. She sighed. Belinda June. Belinda June. He said the name slowly, giving it a musical cadence. Pretty. I like it. Sorry, I'm BJ now, and for always. She stopped beside her truck. Will I, uh, see you at church Sunday? Yep, Dad and I will be there. I'll join you afterward, and we'll corner Reverend Baker. He pulled her door open for her. Drive safe. It appeared all her worries about a hug had been for naught. Quashing an inappropriate pang of disappointment, she slid behind the wheel. Have a nice Saturday, and thanks for lending your talent to the scenery and sets. My pleasure. He shut her door and stepped back. Well, that apparently was that.
BJ rammed the key into the lock, started the engine, and drove away. When she glanced in the rearview mirror, he was already striding toward his own car. Had she imagined those romantic vibes wafting around the scene shop? Or had he picked up her nervousness and gallantly backed off? Not that it mattered. The result had been what she'd sought. A clean escape with no emotional entanglements. Yet hard as she tried to suppress it, all at once she foolishly wished she'd sent the tempting, dark-eyed attorney a whole different set of signals. Chapter 18 The waves lapped gently against the sand in the sheltered cove, while seals frolicked on the sea stack a hundred yards offshore, and the sun shone in a cloudless blue sky. Best of all, he had a paintbrush in his hand and hours to kill. Eric gave a contented sigh. It was a perfect Saturday. Or as perfect as it could be when you were out of a job, trying to decide what to do with the rest of your life, and fantasizing about a beautiful architect who kept you tossing half the night. He rolled his shoulders and let out a slow breath. He'd come close yesterday at the scene shop to breaking every rule he'd made about BJ. If she hadn't started telegraphing some serious anxiety signals, he'd have given her another parting hug one that could easily have morphed into an embrace that went way beyond friendship. Taking a break today, removing himself from temptation had been wise, even if he'd have preferred to spend the day in her company. But he'd see her in church tomorrow, and until then, a whole glorious day of painting stretched before him. From his spot beside the sheer rock face, in the shadow of majestic fir trees, he surveyed the deserted cove that had been his favorite fair weather painting spot since the day he'd found it as a teen. Although the small crescent-shaped beach was accessible from Shore Acres State Park, few visitors bothered to hike down and explore it, or dip their toes in the turquoise water. Their loss. Shifting his attention to the easel, he examined the composition he'd roughed in yesterday with diluted burnt umber paint. The scene had nothing to do with this cove, which served as studio, not subject, and it was very sketchy. Yet he could see the finished piece in his mind. A small, placid river, a bright summer day, a woman knee-deep in the water, holding the side of a rowboat with one hand, the other extended in a silent, tempting invitation toward the viewer. But what lay ahead, beyond the gentle curve of the river? Were there beautiful vistas and smooth sailing, or rough water and dangerous rapids? Would the trip be fun or frightening? The finished painting would offer no answer to those questions. Viewers would have to decide whether to accept the invitation to adventure based on their own tolerance for risk and their life experience. It was a piece that would make people think about more than a simple excursion on a river, he hoped. That could have some potential. Eric jerked and spun around. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. Charlie strolled toward him across the sand. How did you, what are you doing here? I like to visit the gardens in the park. The roses are always spectacular in July. I often swing by this cove while I'm here. Pretty spot. He gave it a leisurely sweep. As I recall, you used to be partial to it. Yeah. But why had Charlie picked today of all days to pay this off the beaten path a visit? What a bizarre coincidence. Nice to see you at an easel again. Charlie slipped his fingers in the back pockets of his jeans as he perused the canvas. I was at the high school yesterday and peeked into the scene shop. Great work on the backdrop. Thanks, but you would have done a better job if you hadn't hurt your... Eric stopped. The bandage was gone. He folded his arms. How's the wrist? Much better. Convenient. Nice ploy. What's that supposed to mean? I'm beginning to think you faked an injury so I'd take on the backdrop, and you hope that would nudge me back into this kind of painting. He tapped the edge of the canvas. You always did have a vivid imagination. 
I expect that's why you excelled at art. When did you start that? He inclined his head toward the roughing canvas. You're dodging my question. I didn't hear one, but I did ask one. Charlie could be as slippery as a slime eel when it suited him, and trying to pin him down if he didn't want to answer a question was an exercise in futility. Yesterday, I don't know how far I'll get with it before I leave. You beating the bushes for a new job? He busied himself straightening the canvas on the easel. I thought I'd take a short break first. Seems reasonable. I'm sure you won't have any trouble connecting somewhere once you're ready. Every town needs a good lawyer. Including Hope Harbor, he thought to himself. The man didn't have to say the words for Eric to get the message, and he wasn't going to pretend he'd missed the implication. Not every town can offer a lawyer a decent living, though. Depends on how you define decent. But big city jobs come with lots of perks you wouldn't find in a small practice, I expect. Not to mention generous salaries, bonuses, benefits, and long hours that don't leave much time for activities like that, Charlie gestured to the easel. Or for people either, I imagine. But I suppose if you're always at the office until the wee hours, you might not notice what's missing at home. Like what? Love, for one thing. Eric stiffened. You seem to have survived just fine without romance, or marriage, or a significant other. The man smiled gently, crinkles radiating from the corners of his eyes. Love comes in many forms. He leaned close to the painting and touched the figure of the woman. Check your perspective here. Given the composition, I think she needs to be a bit bigger. Good luck. With that... He swiveled around and strolled back toward the path that led to the bluff overlooking the cove. Eric waited until he was out of sight, then evaluated the roughed-in figure. Charlie's assessment was sound. It did need to be bigger. As for the rest of their conversation, sometimes the man talked in riddles, and Eric wasn't going to waste this beautiful day trying to solve them. Nor was he going to let Charlie's insinuations bother him. Practicing law in Hope Harbor was a ridiculous idea. There wasn't enough legal work in the town to keep food on the table, let alone provide him with the kind of upscale life he'd led in Portland. As for love, he was working on figuring that out now, thanks to BJ. In the meantime, he'd do what he, not the town's taco master artist, thought was best for his life. As soon as he figured out what that was. She had to make her move, with or without Eric. BJ rose from her pew and scanned the emptying church. He'd been here for services. She'd seen him and John enter, but there was no sign of either now. Had he forgotten his promise to provide moral support while she broached her test case idea to Reverend Baker? Tamping down her nerves, she brushed a hand down her skirt. No matter, it was her idea, and she didn't need a man to... Eric emerged from the shadows in the back of church, lifted a hand in greeting, and strode toward her. Sorry, Dad insisted on introducing me to a guy who's planning to open a business here. Between you and me, I think he wanted to mooch some free legal advice. He wrinkled his brow and scrutinized her. You weren't worried I'd stood you up, were you? I, uh, didn't think you were the type to do that. Warmth crept onto her cheeks at the obvious hedge. But once or twice burned, thrice shy, I understand. He touched her arm. And I'm sorry if my delay upset you. I hope you'll eventually realize I keep my word, always. Now. Are you ready to talk to Reverend Baker? He's still greeting people out front, but the line is dwindling. Everyone's making a beeline for the donuts. Ready as I'll ever be. I think he's gonna be 100% on board with your idea. Eric stepped aside as she left the pew, then fell in beside her, his hand on the small of her back as they skirted a small cluster of congregants lingering in the aisle. 
she had to fight the temptation to lean back into his touch. A few gray clouds had gathered during the service, and the sun was hiding as they joined the end of the line to greet the minister. BJ, nice to see you. Reverend Baker cocooned her hand in a warm clasp when she drew close. You too, Eric? Are you enjoying your visit home? Yes, although it's been busier than I expected. I heard about the fine work you've done on the backdrop for our fundraising show. Helping hands is grateful. It was my pleasure. Speaking of helping hands, BJ tried to quash the flutter in her stomach. If you have a minute, I'd like to run an idea by you related to the program I proposed. Of course. Let me greet these last few stragglers and we'll go back inside. BJ eased out of the line of traffic while the minister shook a few more hands. But as he was wrapping up, Father Kevin pulled into the parking lot and got out of his car. He's early, Reverend Baker planted his hands on his hips. He may be tardy for meetings, but he never misses a tea time. I thought you two played golf on Thursdays. As the priest retrieved his clubs from the trunk, BJ returned Tracy's wave across the lawn, where members of the congregation were chatting in small groups. We do, but Kevin had an unexpected sick call at the hospital in Coos Bay this week, and we had to reschedule. The priest raised a hand in greeting as he trotted across the lawn to join them. Club swung over his shoulder. Good morning, all. Let me guess, you came early to filch some of our donuts. Reverend Baker gave him a stern look. I think I'm insulted, the priest huffed, but there was no missing the twinkle in his merry eyes. I assume the service would be long over and that everyone would be gone. We aren't like Catholics here, you know. No one in this church leaves before the end of the service, and we actually like to linger afterward and enjoy some food and fellowship. Hmm, the priest sniffed. Our people come to pray, not eat and socialize. There isn't one mention in the Bible about stuff in your face after going to church. He extended his hand to Eric. I don't believe we've met, and since my fellow cleric appears to be more worried about his donut supply than decorum, I'll do the honors myself. Kevin Murphy. Eric took his hand, and BJ tried not to chuckle as his uncertain gaze flicked from one man to the other. No one must have clued him in to the notorious and good-natured jibing between the two clerics. Nice to meet you, Eric said. Given the early arrival of my golfing partner, Reverend Baker turned to her. Would you like to defer our discussion? BJ glanced back toward Tracy and Michael, who continued to chat on the lawn with another couple. As a matter of fact, if we can corral Michael, it might be better if all three of you heard this. Let me run over and see if he has a minute. I'll fill Kevin in on the reason for this impromptu meeting while you're gone. Reverend Baker launched into the explanation as she hurried across the grass. By the time she returned with Michael in tow and they all moved into the back of the church, her pulse was hammering. As if sensing her nervousness, Eric edged in close. So close she could feel his breath on her temple as if he wanted her to know he was on her side. Strange. For a woman who'd always taken pride in standing on her own two feet and meeting every challenge without the need for hand-holding, it felt surprisingly nice to have Eric in her corner. She squeezed the strap of her purse and plunged in. I know you all have other plans for the day, so I'll keep this short. Michael passed on the board's concerns about my proposal, and I believe we can overcome quite a few of them. Eric has agreed to develop a boilerplate agreement while he's here and perhaps line us up with continuing legal assistance. One of the other major hurdles appears to be lack of a model program, but I think I may have a solution for that. As she laid out her plan, it was difficult to judge the reaction of the three men. They were attentive, and their expressions were encouraging and receptive, but she wasn't going to draw any conclusions until they voiced their opinions. Once she wrapped up, Michael was the first to speak. I think that's a great suggestion. If the test goes smoothly with those two subjects, I can't imagine the board will drag its feet about proceeding. I concur. It's an excellent idea, BJ. 
Reverend Baker beamed at her. What do you think, Kevin? That I wish I'd thought of it myself. I don't know Eleanor very well, but I do know Luis, and the man is due for a break. I've tried and tried to persuade him to apply for government assistance or to take some of our St. Vincent de Paul funds for food and housing, but accepting charity is anathema to him. The question is, will we be able to convince him this isn't charity? I have a few arguments up my sleeve, and I may call on you for backup with Luis if necessary. BJ turned to Reverend Baker. And yours with Eleanor. Happy to assist. Father Kevin peeked at his watch and adjusted the golf clubs on his shoulder. If that wraps things up for now. You have a tea time, BJ smiled. I won't keep you any longer. Enjoy your game. Always. Kevin, I'll change, grab my clubs, and meet you at my car. Give me ten minutes. The minister walked them to the door. Don't hurry on my account. I'll mosey over to the fellowship hall and have a donut or two. Aha! I knew that was why you came early. Hey, I don't want them to go to waste. Waste not, want not, you know. Reverend Baker rolled his eyes. Leave it to a Catholic to quote Ben Franklin instead of the Bible. Father Kevin bristled. Don't start with that Catholics don't read the Bible bit again. Judge not that ye be not judged. Is that the best you can do? Even non-believers know that one. What is this, Bible Jeopardy? When the minister began to speak, Father Kevin held up his hand. I have just one more comment on the subject. Do not envy those who are wrong. Like grass, they wither quickly. Psalms, in case that didn't ring a bell. I'm impressed. I'd rather impress you with my golf game. <laughs> On that note, I believe I'll rejoin my lovely wife. Lips twitching, Michael angled away from the clerics. BJ, I'll look forward to hearing a report on your progress. Keep me informed and let me know if I can help. I will. Thanks for being receptive to my experiment. And I'm off to the fellowship hall, Father Kevin motioned toward it. Would you two like to join me while my golfing companion gets ready for our game? I think I'll pass, Padre. Eric pulled out his keys. I need to round up my dad. And I have helping hands plans to make. BJ retrieved her own keys. Remember, let me know if you need any help persuading Luis. The priest took off for the fellowship hall. Reverend Baker shook his head as his friend departed. I better hurry or he'll scarf down half a dozen donuts, and his cholesterol is too high already. Talk to you both soon. As the minister closed the door, Eric smiled. It took me a minute to catch on, but to use an old cliche, I take it those two are peas in a pod. They are. According to Tracy, when Reverend Baker moved here eight years ago and took the helm of Grace Christian after his wife died, Father Kevin sent him a pack of expensive golf balls and an invitation to the Lynx. That was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. But their bantering is a stitch. She played with her keys. You know, I think I'll swing by Eleanor's and claim that piece of fudge cake she offered. Would you like to join me? I have a feeling she'd be willing to part with two pieces. I wish I could, but I promised Dad I'd join him for a belated welcome home breakfast at the cafe this morning. I could go later. That wasn't gonna work. Much as she'd like his company, she was too impatient to wait. That's okay. I might need backup with Luis, but talking with Eleanor shouldn't be an issue. Maybe I could swing by your house later for an update, if you'll be home. Her spirits took a decided uptick. That would be great. For now, let me walk you to your truck at least. He rested his hand on the small of her back again and guided her toward the parking lot. So you think Eleanor will be an easy sell? Yes. She's such a kind, sweet, caring woman. Given Luis's history and the fact that the entire program could hinge on her participation, I think she'd be receptive even if there wasn't anything in it for her. 
but in light of her own situation and her recent fall, I can't imagine she won't welcome an opportunity to have a very skilled person on hand who can help with both home maintenance and any medical issues that might crop up. I'm more worried about convincing Louise. Count on me for that discussion. And if we both strike out, we can enlist Father Kevin. Trust me, I'm keeping that as an option. She pressed the auto lock button on her keychain. Eric pulled open the driver's side door and she slid behind the wheel. Think positive. He winked and closed the door. BJ started the engine, waved goodbye, and followed his advice as she accelerated toward Eleanor's. Because to make this program fly, they needed both her and Luis on their side. Chapter 19 BJ wanted her to let a stranger live in her house. A stranger from Cuba. A man who spoke with a foreign accent and was still adjusting to American customs. As Eleanor tried to grapple with the request her visitor had just dropped in her lap, she tightened her grip on Methuselah. The old feline let out a yowl of protest, wriggled out of her grasp, and scurried across the kitchen with a sulky glare. Mercy, Methuselah isn't in the best of moods today, is he? Her hand fluttered to her chest as she tried to summon up a smile for BJ, but her lips refused to cooperate. Creases appeared on the young woman's forehead. I think I might have thrown too much at you at once, Eleanor. She moved her half-eaten piece of fudge cake aside. This project has been near and dear to my heart for months, and I tend to assume everyone will jump on board the minute they hear about it. I probably ran through the details too fast. You must have a lot of questions. No, as a matter of fact, she didn't. She understood both the proposal and the benefits to herself and Louise. But despite the heartbreaking tale BJ had told her about the man's background, she knew little else about him, or the country he came from, or the culture that had shaped him, or his moral character. BJ and Father Kevin might think he was a fine person, but they weren't being asked to live under the same roof with him either. Heavens! Didn't they have drug smuggling and corruption and crime and, and communism down in Cuba? With those shady Castro brothers in charge? Living in an environment like that could have a negative effect even on a well-educated person like Luis. Couldn't it? However, suggesting that to the sweet girl sitting across the kitchen table from her, who, no doubt, believed the best of everyone, might not be appropriate. I can't think of a single question. You took me by surprise, my dear. My brain hasn't quite caught up. What does your friend Luis have to say about this? I haven't mentioned it to him yet. I thought it would be easier to talk with you first. She swallowed as if the fallacy of that assumption had left a bad taste in her mouth. He's opposed to taking charity of any kind, so I need to think about how to present it to him in a way he'll find acceptable. I see. BJ laced her fingers on the table, knuckles whitening as she leaned closer. Luis is very quiet and agreeable, Eleanor. I'm certain he'd be happy to abide by whatever parameters you set, assuming I can convince him to give the arrangement a try and we could begin with a limited trial period, if you like. At that point, you could both reevaluate and decide whether you want to continue. Would any of this be in writing? Not that a contract would clear up her uneasiness, but extending the discussion would buy her a few minutes to come up with a response. Yes, I should have mentioned that up front. Eric is planning to draw up a legal agreement. Liability issues would be covered and responsibilities laid out. Also, since no cash will exchange hands, there aren't any tax implications. Eleanor touched a paper napkin to the corner of her mouth. Everything BJ had said made sense, and Lord knew she needed some help. Yet she couldn't summon up an ounce of enthusiasm for the idea. The hard knot of fear lodged in her chest got in the way. 
But why was she afraid? From what she'd seen and heard, Luis didn't appear to be a menace to anyone, and he'd endured more than his share of suffering and loss. If anyone deserved a second chance, it was him. Plus, he'd come to her aid in her moment of need. As far as she could see, her fear had no basis. Nevertheless, she couldn't shake it. And until, unless, she managed to do that, she couldn't give this sweet girl the answer she wanted. I do appreciate all the effort you've put into this program, BJ. It's a fine idea, and I can see how it will benefit Hope Harbor residents. However, I must admit that the notion of having someone live under my roof is a bit unsettling. Why don't you let me think about it for a day or two? Of course. BJ swallowed and picked up her fork, set it down again. Um, do you think I could take the rest of this with me? I guess I ate too much breakfast. Being too full wasn't the reason for her sudden loss of appetite. Disappointment was written all over the girl's face. Eleanor crumpled her napkin into a tight ball. Much as she hated to stand in the way of BJ's plan, it couldn't be helped. She wasn't going to agree to this sort of arrangement without a lot of thought and soul searching. There's plastic wrap in the third drawer. You know where it is. And take a piece for that nice young man of yours, too. Eric? BJ shot her a startled look. Yes. He's not my... We're not involved. No? Ah, well... This old romantic heart of mine has a tendency to get carried away. In silence, BJ rose, wrapped up the remains of her treat and a piece for Eric, then offered a smile that seemed forced. If you have any questions as you think about this, don't hesitate to call. I won't. Eleanor started to rise, but BJ placed a gentle hand on her shoulder. Don't bother to get up. I'll see myself out. She sank back without protest. Give my best to that nice young man and enjoy the rest of your day, my dear. Thanks. You too. BJ bent and gave her a quick hug. Half a minute later, the front door clicked shut. Eleanor eyed Methuselah, who continued to keep his distance. I won't squeeze you hard again, my friend. Want to come back and curl up in my lap? He sniffed and nose in the air, stalked into the living room and his favorite sunny spot on the carpet. At least one of the occupants of this house had no ambiguity about his feelings. Eleanor pushed herself to her feet, giving her stiff knees a few seconds to loosen up while she placed her empty iced tea glass on the tray on the front of the walker. Once she got a refill, she'd settle into her chair in the living room and mull over BJ's proposal. At the refrigerator, she paused to examine her collage of photos as usual. Such happy memories. All those exciting trips with Stan by her side, plus the activities that had brought her fulfillment back in the days when she'd made a difference in the lives of others. Except, she frowned her gaze skipping from photo to photo. Birthright, food pantry, church mission work. All worthwhile activities, but her work had been done at arm's length, from behind the scenes, insulated from those she was helping. Come to think of it, had she ever directly touched the life of someone in need, person to person? Hard as she tried, she couldn't come up with one instance where she had left her comfort zone to get personally involved. All her life, she'd played it safe. In fact, the biggest risk she'd ever taken was marrying Stan and moving away from the town where she'd grown up. Yet once he died, she'd scurried back here as fast as she could to the comfort of familiar surroundings. She examined the photos again, one by one. Was it possible she was being too hard on herself about her hands-off role? 
Wasn't it okay to support charities from a distance? After all, people who work behind the scenes, removed from the actual beneficiaries, produce lots of positive results. But if you were asked to help one person specifically, wasn't there an obligation to do so if you had the ability? Yes, Eleanor, there is. As the gentle chide echoed softly in her mind, fear bubbled up inside her again, along with denial. I can't do this, Lord. Most of the people I helped years ago, they weren't like me. They were a different color, or spoke a different language, or lived in a family situation, or a degree of poverty I can't begin to understand. We had nothing in common. Or did they? The lesson Charlie had passed on from his grandmother the day he'd brought her those tacos replayed in her mind. The notion that while looks and language and traditions might differ, all hearts feel the same emotions. The woman might have lived thousands of miles away in a foreign country, but she'd been wise, as was her grandson. A man whose skin was a different color and who had come from a culture that was foreign to her. A man she'd known for two decades and had never once invited into her home, though she'd befriended other merchants in town. Truth be told, she'd often included people she knew far less well than Charlie on the guest list for the annual Christmas open house she'd held until her arthritis finally forced her to give up the tradition. Eleanor tightened her grip on the walker to steady herself as the truth smacked her in the face. She was prejudiced. Dear Lord, the whispered words reverberated in the silent kitchen as she locked onto the photo of herself mugging for the camera in the back room of the food pantry. She'd never dealt with the people lining up for the food because deep inside, she'd considered herself better than them. Her vision blurred, the photos on the refrigerator melding together in a sea of shame. She might have done worthwhile work, but always with a holier-than-thou attitude. Never had she reached out a hand directly to a stranger in need or made a personal investment in an individual life. But she had a chance to do that now, with Luis. If she could muster the courage to let go of fear and self-righteousness. Instead of refilling her glass, she trundled into the living room, lowered herself into her chair, and picked up the Bible from its place on the table beside her. Perhaps the good book and prayer would offer her guidance and answers. Yet she didn't open the dog-eared pages, because she already knew what she should do. She had the means to add a touch of joy and comfort to a life sorely in need of it, and to help ensure that BJ's worthwhile program was given a chance to succeed so others in her situation would be able to stay in the homes they loved. Eleanor leaned her head against the upholstered back of the chair, smoothing a finger over the worn cover on the book, the weight of it familiar and comforting in her hands. Forgive me, Lord for being afraid of people who are different than me. Help me find the courage to do what the Good Samaritan did that day on the roadside. Give me grace and compassion to overcome my narrow-mindedness and bigotry. Help me drive out any feelings of superiority. Let me see everyone as an equal and a worthy brother and sister, and act accordingly. A soft meow sounded at her feet, and Methuselah put one paw on her leg. She leaned down to give him an assist into her lap, where the cat curled into a ball and turned those intelligent amber eyes on her. What would you think about having another person live here with us, my friend? She stroked his soft fur. He adjusted his position, one paw draped over the Bible, as if pointing her toward scripture for her answer. Eleanor scratched behind his ear. Excellent advice. Easing the book from beneath his paw, she opened it. Some reading, some prayer, some thinking, some sleep. 
She'd do all those things before she made a decision. In all of her 88 years, no one had ever accused her of being rash. And she wasn't about to become impulsive at this late date. But no matter how long she deliberated or dragged her feet, she knew where the process would lead. The real question was, would she be brave enough in the end to follow the direction she received and take the leap into unknown and daunting territory? The meeting with Eleanor hadn't gone well. As Eric rounded the corner of BJ's house after the doorbell went unanswered, he took a moment to study her unobserved. She was sitting at the patio table, staring out to sea, distress carved into every line of her features. His first instinct was to pull her into a hug, but he tempered the impulse. Later, that might be appropriate. First, he needed to let her tell him what had happened. She turned as he drew close, as if sensing his presence, and gave him a shaky smile. Hi, I'm back. He took the chair beside her. You don't look happy. Her throat worked as she swallowed. I should have waited for you. What happened? He listened as she recounted her visit with Eleanor, resting his elbows on the arms of his chair and steepling his fingers. I have a feeling it wouldn't have mattered whether I was there or not. You could be right, she sighed. I guess it seemed like such a perfect solution for her and Luis that it didn't occur to me she'd see any negatives in it. Maybe she just needs to get used to the idea of having someone else living under her roof. That would be a big adjustment for her. I don't think that was a stumbling block. It was more like she was, BJ shrugged. I don't even know how to describe it. From the beginning, I got the feeling she was unreceptive. She needed the bridge of her nose. I guess I totally misread this. Did she say no? Not in words, but her body language spoke volumes. She asked for some time to think about it. You want to pay her another visit tomorrow? I could go with you. Strength and numbers and all that. I guess it might be worth a try. You made quite an impression on her, in case you didn't know. He flashed her a grin. She must be easy to impress. I only paid her one very brief visit. Sometimes it doesn't take long to discern a person's character. She locked gazes with him. He studied her. Are we still talking about Eleanor? No. The soft breeze ruffled her hair, which was loose and full today. She hadn't changed out of the slim skirt and soft blouse she'd worn to church this morning, and the hue of the shimmering silk was a perfect match for her jade irises. Lovely. And hard to resist. He tried to satisfy his yearning by reaching for her hand. I'm trying very hard to remember my promise to you, BJ. He cleared the huskiness out of his voice. However, you're making it difficult. Her throat contracted. Maybe I don't want you to remember it. Eric forced himself to take a slow, deep breath. BJ was disappointed in the outcome of today's meeting. Her emotions were in turmoil. Comfort, not romance, was what was called for no matter how tempting her implied invitation. I promised you we'd be friends when I leave. We're already friends. I want to keep it that way. And what about what I want? Which is, she didn't miss a beat. You, holding me, like you did that night at the scene shop. A friendly hug? She hesitated, then gave a slow nod. Yes. That's not what her eyes were saying, but he'd try his best to honor her verbal request. I can do that. He rose and tugged her to her feet, giving little Gull Island a quick sweep. Casper's not around, is he? A smile tweaked the corners of her mouth. I haven't seen him. Good. I don't want another rude interruption. 
He pulled her into his arms, tucked her against him, and dipped his head to inhale the fresh scent of her hair. Her heart thudded against his chest as he rested his cheek against her temple, and he had to work hard to convince his lungs to keep inflating and deflating. Just like the last time he'd held her, this felt right and meant to be, and better than any. All at once, the cell phone in his pocket began to vibrate. She jerked back, breaking the connection, and let out a shaky laugh. That was a weird sensation. Sorry, I'll turn it off. He pulled it out. Don't you want to see who it is first? Not really. What he wanted was to go back to that hug. He gave the screen a quick scan, trying to place the vaguely familiar name. Oh, yeah. The guy his father had introduced him to after church today. Huh. He'd assumed the man's request for contact info was mere politeness to make up for picking his brain for ten minutes. Go ahead and take it. BJ eased back and retook her seat. No reason not to now. The romantic mood was gone, through no fault of Casper's. As soon as Eric said hello, the man got down to business. I enjoyed meeting you earlier today. After I got home, I did some Googling, and I'm impressed with your background. Your father said you're visiting between jobs, but I wondered if you were planning to be around long enough to draw up some incorporation paperwork for the new business I mentioned. It appears you've had plenty of corporate legal experience. I could find an attorney in Coos Bay, but I'd rather work with someone from Hope Harbor. Eric focused on the horizon where a large ship traveling to places unknown hovered in the mist between land and sea. How should he respond to the out-of-the-blue request? When the silence lengthened, the man spoke again. I understand you're here on a vacation of sorts, and I don't mean to infringe on that. But based on your experience, I don't think this would be a major commitment. Unless you're planning to leave within the next week or two. No, I'll be around for a while. He glanced over at BJ, who'd retaken her seat at the table. In that case, could we get together tomorrow to discuss this? If you decide to pass after that, I'll understand. Why not? The only other item on his Monday agenda was working on his painting. Sure, I can do that. After arranging to meet at the cafe for a late breakfast, they said their goodbyes. That sounded interesting. BJ crossed her legs. Eric tried to ignore her shapely calf as he sat beside her. Yeah, that was the, uh, guy who cornered me at church this morning. He needs some legal assistance. I guess he wasn't mooching after all. I guess not. Are you gonna help him out? I didn't come down here to work, but it sounds like a simple incorporation, which wouldn't take long. I'll have to research fees for that sort of job, though. I have a few law school friends I can contact who are single practitioners in smaller towns. They should be able to give me what I need, if I decide to let work interrupt my time off. Hmm, she looked out over the sea. Speaking of work infringing on play, I'm curious about something. Her tone was casual, but some subtle undercurrent put him on alert. What's that? She transferred her attention to him. I know you put in long hours in Portland, but how come you're not married or involved with someone? You're a well-educated, accomplished man who also happens to be a nice guy. I would have pegged you as a chick magnet. His neck warmed. That was direct. We agreed to be honest with each other, and since you know my whole dismal dating history, I didn't think that question was out of line. No, it wasn't. He did owe her some relationship background, except there wasn't much to tell. I've never been serious about anyone. I date on occasion, but my job has always been my focal point. I was never willing to invest the time required for a long-term relationship. And you never got lonely? The wistfulness in her inflection tugged at his heart, and he thought back to Charlie's comment in the cove yesterday. The man had nailed it. With my grueling work schedule, I didn't have a chance to get lonely. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise then. A few weeks ago, he might have agreed with her. 
But since he'd been home, since she'd entered his life, he was all too aware of what he'd been missing. And if he went back to that lifestyle, uh, no, when he went back to that lifestyle, he had a feeling it was gonna be a lot harder to keep the loneliness at bay, no matter how many hours a day he worked. It might have been. I bet you never had a problem getting a date if you wanted one, though. No. Why play coy? Lucky you. Dating isn't all it's cracked up to be, BJ. Noisy bars, crowded restaurants, making small talk, discovering 15 minutes into the date that you have no desire to spend the next three or four hours with someone and, and having to endure the rest of the evening. You never met anyone whose company you enjoyed for a whole evening? Once in a while, but never anyone I was willing to sacrifice billable hours for. She gave a soft laugh. That is utterly unromantic. Until now. At his caveat, her laugh died. What, what do you mean? He had no idea. I, uh, meant that if we'd met in Portland, I would have found time to see you. Oh, that was all she said but it was obvious from her subdued tone she'd hoped for more. That she'd wanted him to say he liked her enough to think about reconsidering the future he'd carefully laid out. But he wasn't there yet, might never be. Changing direction after the years of effort he'd plowed into his career was a decision that required a lot of careful thought. And until he was ready to make it, the wise course was to steer clear of the subject. So are you gonna pay Eleanor another visit tomorrow? I could go with you after you finish at the house for the day, if you like. I think I'll wait until she gets back to me. If she says no, I can give it one more try. I, not we. She was pulling back. And who could blame her? She'd been very clear about her interest in him, and he hadn't responded the way she'd hoped. After all the hurt she'd endured in previous dating experiences, she was wise to protect herself. He needed to protect her, too, by maintaining the just-friend status quo until he knew what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. I guess I'll be going. He rose. Eleanor sent you some fudge cake. Let me get it for you. She stood, skirted the far side of the patio table, and disappeared into the house. Fifteen seconds later, she was back, a plastic-wrapped wedge in hand. Thanks. He took it from her. I'm only the delivery person. You need to thank the baker. I'll do that. Behind him, a loud belch sounded. Casper's back. BJ folded her arms tight against her chest. Her smile strained around the edges as she turned toward Little Gull Island. He may not be polite, but he's predictable. The little guy never fails to show up when I need to see a friendly face. I have a friendly face, too. She angled back toward him, no trace of humor in her demeanor now. And though her words were soft, they packed a punch. But you might not always show up. I can't take that risk, Eric. It wasn't an ultimatum. BJ wasn't the type to resort to that. She was simply stating a fact. But ultimatum or not, he knew as he said goodbye that they would share no more hugs unless he found a long-term potential way to incorporate her into his life. Chapter 20 The persistent ring of the phone pulled Eleanor from sleep and as her location registered, her jaw dropped. Good heavens, she'd spent the night in her recliner. The phone trailed again, and she fumbled in the pocket of her slacks while Methuselah gave her a puzzled look, as if he couldn't figure out why she'd never gone to bed. Because I was up late thinking about BJ's visit, if you must know, and fell asleep in my chair. The cat yawned, stretched, and moseyed out to the kitchen in search of breakfast, no doubt. She finally put the phone to her ear and said hello. Good morning, Eleanor. How are you today? 
Rose's cheery voice came over the line. The woman sounded awake and alert, as if she'd been up for hours. What time was it anyway? Eleanor peered at her watch. Eight o'clock, past her usual rising time. I'm fine, thanks. She smothered a yawn with her free hand. Oh, dear. I didn't wake you, did I? You know I never sleep late, Rose. A true statement, even if today happened to be an exception to that rule. I know. That's why I didn't think you'd mind an early call. I heard you had a fall, and I wanted to see how you were doing. It wasn't a fall. It was a misstep. And how did you find out about it? I happened to overhear Charlie ask that nice BJ about you at the taco stand last evening. I wasn't eavesdropping, mind you. No, that wouldn't be Rose's style. They'd been friends too long for her to doubt the other woman's honesty or genuine concern. I'm right as rain. Nothing more than a bruise or two. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Falls can be serious for these old bones of ours. Did you hear about Martha? Martha who? Atwood. I believe you've met her at a few church functions. She lives in Coos Bay, but has a number of friends in town who invite her to special events. A vague image formed in her mind of a tall, thin woman with silver hair. I think I know who you mean. I'm sure you'd recognize her if you saw her. To make a long story short, she fell off a step stool in her kitchen while changing a light bulb, broke her pelvis and arm and a couple of ribs. Rose tut-tutted. Now she's in rehab and has had all kinds of complications. She lives alone, so there's some doubt about whether she'll be able to return home. It's such a shame. Yes, it is. A cloud of doom settled over her. That could be her future someday. Well, on to cheerier subjects. Besides checking on you, I was hoping to convince you to have lunch with me at the cafe tomorrow. We haven't done that in ages. And afterward, if you're up to it, we could stop in at the grocery store. I'd be happy to get anything you need, but I know you enjoy trips to the market. Her spirits took an uptick. That would be lovely. I was beginning to get cabin fever. Wonderful. I'll pick you up at 11. Take care. Methuselah wandered back in as she ended the call. After sitting on his haunches, he gave her an annoyed stare. You're hungry, aren't you? He meowed. So am I. She set her Bible on the table, juggled her walker into position, and hoisted herself to her feet. Let's see what we can round up for breakfast. The tabby rose to and did a U-turn toward the kitchen. She followed, slowing as she passed the bulging rack of cookbooks. In the old days, she'd been a whiz in the kitchen. Stan had liked to brag about her skills to his friends. At least, in that one area of her life, she'd been bold and adventuresome. Resting one hand on the walker, she skimmed her fingers over the spines of the books. When had she last made any of these recipes? Her final Christmas open house, perhaps, several years ago. The layer of dust on top told the story. She started to move on, but stopped as one title caught her eye. International Favorites Made Easy. That had been a fun book to page through, and Stan had enjoyed the recipes she'd tried from it. He'd always said the dishes made him feel like he was dining in exotic locations without ever leaving the comforts of his home. She touched the book as an idea began to take shape in her mind. Hmm. She pulled it out, continued toward the table, and set it down. Reading material for breakfast. And potentially something more. Come on in out of the rain, Eric. Knuckles poised over the studio door, Eric froze. Once again, Charlie had somehow known not only that he had a visitor, but who the visitor was. The man must have some kind of security system he kept under wraps. Eric lowered his hand, twisted the knob, and ducked in out of the soupy weather. Charlie swiveled toward him on his painting stool as strains of Vivaldi filled the studio. What brings you all the way out here on such a dreary day? 
They gave the space a quick sweep. No visible security monitor, but that was meaningless. Knowing Charlie's aversion to all things electronic, he had it tucked in some unobtrusive... Eric? He snapped his head back to the artist. I, uh, was hoping to get in some painting today, but my favorite spot is out of the question in this weather, and the house is noisy and dusty. Besides, no one other than his dad and Charlie knew he'd started painting again, and he wanted to keep it that way for now. Your easel's still in the closet. Charlie went back to his work in progress. Help yourself, and let me know if you need any other supplies. The same greeting he used to give him in the old days. It was like rewinding the clock 20 years. After retrieving his painting gear from the car and getting situated, Eric went to work. Within minutes, he was lost in the creative process. Only when he paused to rotate the kinks out of his neck did Charlie speak. Want a soda? Yeah, thanks. He glanced at his watch, blinked. Where had the past two hours gone? Charlie sauntered over and handed him a Dr. Pepper, swigging his Coke as he examined the painting that was beginning to come to life. As the artist took his sweet time perusing it, sweat began to bead on both the can and Eric's forehead. When he couldn't stand it any longer, he popped the tab and spoke. Well, you haven't lost your talent. Charlie swirled his soda and scrutinized the painting. I see you fixed the proportion on the woman. Yeah, better. The hint of gray in the distant sky is a clever touch, too. Adds to the subtle tension, the sense of the unknown. A dash of permanent violet dark might enhance that mood. I have some if you need it. He wandered over to the turntable and changed out Vivaldi for Gershwin. Eric stood and stretched. You opening the taco stand today? Maybe later. The strains of Rhapsody in Blue filled the room. How'd your meeting at the diner go this morning? Eric almost choked on his soda. How did you know about that? I stopped in for an omelet and saw you. How come I didn't see you? Guess you were too engrossed in that intense discussion you were having. Seems serious. Eric swigged his soda. It had been, and he had some decisions to make. But he'd forgotten all about them once he began painting. It was. The guy I was with wants me to do some legal work for him while I'm here. You interested? Charlie wandered back to his easel. I don't know. It's an easy job, and the pay's not bad. Better than he'd expected, actually, based on the fee schedules forwarded to him by his law school colleagues who'd gone into small-town practice. Sounds like a no-brainer. Eric retook his seat. You want the truth? I'd rather paint while I'm here. A person can't paint 16 hours a day, not without going crazy. Look what happened to poor Van Gogh. That's why I have the taco stand. Variety is the spice of life. Too much of anything can warp your viewpoint. I practice law 16 hours a day in Portland. I rest my case. Very funny. Charlie drained his can of Coke and settled back on his stool. That wasn't a joke. How's life been since you left those kinds of hours behind? Better, happier, more interesting. But he kept that to himself. Different. You enjoying yourself? For the most part. Then why not work a little law back in? Sounds like this legal job would leave you plenty of time for other pursuits, and it would help keep your skills sharp. I'm considering it. Charlie picked up his paintbrush. Makes sense to me. As the other man went back to painting, Eric finished his own soda and set the empty can on the floor beside him. Charlie's advice about painting and life tended to be sound. Maybe he ought to take the job. If nothing else, it would ease him back into law, so returning to the rat race wouldn't be a total shock. Rat race. Bad choice of words. Partner track had a better ring to it. But as the driving beat of the Gershwin classic filled the room, he knew they were one and the same. 
and he was less and less certain that reaching the finish line he'd always planned across was going to bring him the kind of joy and satisfaction he'd expected. Stone, would you grab that piece of crown molding and... Hang on a sec. Holding on to the ladder with one hand, BJ pulled her vibrating cell out of her pocket with the other and skimmed the screen. Eleanor. The woman must be ready to give her an answer. And BJ had a sinking feeling she knew what it was going to be. If her intuition was correct, she might have to take Eric up on his offer to accompany her while she paid the woman a second visit. Even if it would be safer to walk a wide circle around him after their parting last night. Anything that gave her companion program a fighting chance would be worth some personal risk. The phone vibrated again, and she descended the ladder. You guys can go ahead and put up that section of crown molding. I'll be back in a minute. As Stone and Luis went to work, she exited the suite, moved down the upstairs hall of what would soon be the Seabird Inn, and greeted her caller. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Eleanor sounded a bit breathless. I have a few minutes to spare. Hammering began to reverberate in the empty room beside her, and she continued down the hall. It would be quieter on the first floor. Well, I've been thinking about your proposal ever since you stopped by yesterday. I have to admit the notion of having a stranger under my roof takes me outside my comfort zone. But after a a lot of thought and prayer, I've decided to explore the possibility. I believe it might help me make a decision if I got to know Luis better. The woman cleared her throat. So if he's interested in the idea, I'd like to invite him to have dinner with me here at the house tomorrow night. BJ stopped halfway down the stairs, sank onto a step leaned a shoulder against the wall. Eleanor hadn't said no. BJ, are you there? Yes. She did her best to regroup. It appeared she didn't need to muster any of the arguments she'd been marshalling, nor did she need to tap into Eric's powers of persuasion. At least not yet. I'm here, and that's great news. I'm glad you're open to the idea. Why don't you check with Luis, see what he says? I know you thought he might have some reservations, too. If you could let me know by this evening whether I should expect him for dinner, I'd appreciate it. Of course. I'll talk to him this afternoon and get back to you as soon as I have an answer. I'll be waiting to hear, sweet child. Don't work too hard now. Once they ended the call, BJ remained sitting on the steps while the hammering continued above her. One hurdle passed. Eleanor hadn't said yes yet, but her willingness to explore the idea was heartening. And once she got to know Luis, she'd be impressed. The man was the perfect solution to all the problems she faced living alone. And she was the perfect solution for him, too. Now all she had to do was convince Luis that her proposal had nothing to do with charity and everything to do with helping those in need, and that he could play a key role in making life better for older Hope Harbor residents. No small challenge. But if she succeeded, her Helping Hands companion program might get off the launching pad after all. BJ was nervous. Louise watched her surreptitiously as she guided the truck toward 101. The unplanned trip to the building supply store wasn't all that unusual, but in general, she didn't take either him or Stone along. Even Stone had raised an eyebrow when she tagged Louise to accompany her. And her white-knuckle grip on the wheel was unsettling. It couldn't have anything to do with his work, though. He put in a full day and never scrimped on effort. She'd complimented him often. Was it possible the green card issue had come up again? He fought back a sudden wave of panic. Tamed it. No, there was no reason to be afraid on that front. He was legal, and he'd done nothing to endanger his status here. That left just one possibility as far as he could see, and it churned his stomach. 
She'd told him from the beginning that her business wasn't yet able to support two permanent full-time workers, but that his place was secure until the Seabird Inn renovation was completed. That job, however, would be winding down in two weeks. Unless there was another big project in the offing, someone would have to be let go. And Stone had seniority. But how would he survive without a job? An image of the paramedic course materials arrayed on his table materialized in his mind, but he erased it. That would be a perfect job, but it wasn't an option. Even if the tuition was free, he needed money to live on. He had to have a job now. Maybe Father Murphy could help him if... Repercussions of that bug we had? As the end of BJ's question registered, he tuned back in. I am sorry, I did not hear what you asked. She shot him a quick, concerned glance. You okay? Yes, much better. The flu is gone. That must be what she'd asked about. No, I meant, you seem a little tense. He seemed tense? Did she realize she was taught as a plumb line? Perhaps he should make this easy for her. She'd done more than enough for him as it was. He couldn't expect her to keep him on the payroll if there wasn't sufficient work. Nor should she feel guilty if she had to let him go. I was thinking that the job, it is almost finished. I understand if you do not need me after that. Her face went blank for a moment, and then understanding dawned in her eyes. She muttered a few unintelligible words under her breath, checked her rearview mirror, and swung into one of the scenic pullouts that line this picturesque stretch of highway. From here, on a clear afternoon, they'd have a panoramic vista of the ocean and the sea stacks that today were shrouded in gray mist. Like his heart. BJ shut off the engine and angled toward him. I'm sorry, Louise. I didn't mean to worry you. Your job with me is secure for the foreseeable future. I have some big projects coming up. Grace Christian wants us to remodel their offices as soon as we finish at John's. And after that, I'll be doing a single-family home out at Harbor Point Cranberries. Then why do you look worried? I'm not worried, exactly. Her death grip on the wheel, however, said otherwise. It's just that a program that means a lot to me is, it's hanging in the balance, and I need your help to make it happen. If there was anything he could do for this woman who'd given him a job when he desperately needed one, he would. Tell me how. He listened as she laid out the proposal she'd presented to the Helping Hands board members, outlined their reservations, and described the model program she wanted him to participate in. Eleanor thinks it would be helpful if you two got to know each other better before either of you commit, and she wanted me to extend an invitation from her for dinner tomorrow night at her house. As she concluded, he turned toward the window. The somber haze hid the beauty of the landscape, but the splendor was there nonetheless, ready to emerge as soon as the sun returned. Was this his chance to brighten his own world while brightening others as well? Perhaps. Moisture clouded his vision as the potential impact of her request began to compute, and he swiped the back of his hand across his eyes. You don't have to commit to anything now except dinner. Tension wove through BJ's words. I would be happy to eat with Eleanor. Her face went blank again as if she was shocked by his answer. Finally, she exhaled, and the strain in her features eased, Excellent. I'll let her know you're coming. She reached over and touched his arm. Thank you for considering this, Luis. The program means a lot to me. It could mean a lot to many people. And I should thank you. Eleanor seems like a nice woman, and her house would be a fine place to live. Well, let's hope you feel the same after sharing dinner with her tomorrow night. She put the truck in gear and pulled back onto the highway, just as a ray of sun managed to peek through the obfuscating fog swirling around them. And as they continued along the winding road, he hoped that was a positive omen for the future. 
beginning with dinner tomorrow. Chapter 21 Louise having dinner with L tomorrow night. Fingers XX BJ. Propping one elbow on the mattress of his sofa sleeper bed, Eric reread the text that had been sent late yesterday afternoon. Funny. In his old life, he'd checked his messages constantly. Here, he often forgot about the phone. And he'd sure forgotten about it at the studio. Once Charlie had left to go open the taco stand for a few hours, he'd lost track of time. Only the dimming light had finally pushed him out. He'd gone straight home, foraged for dinner in the fridge, and crashed, as exhausted as if he'd spent a full day in court. It had been a better type of exhaustion, though, the kind that comes from pouring your soul into your passion. But he should have skimmed his messages once he got home. BJ must be wondering why he hadn't responded. He also owed his potential client a response, based on the follow-up email the man had sent pressing for an answer. The banging overhead that had awakened him started up again. He could respond to BJ in person. An email acceptance would suffice for the client. At least his conversation with Charlie had clarified that decision. He did have time for both art and law in his present circumstances, and the two might balance each other. He couldn't paint intensely 16 hours a day, or he would end up like Van Gogh. Yesterday's marathon had been invigorating, but draining. He tapped in a response to the client, pulled on his jeans, ran a comb through his hair, and left his makeshift living room suite to track down BJ. We missed you at breakfast. His father turned from the dining room table across the foyer, where he was sorting through what looked like Mom's collection of napkin rings. Sorry, I slept like a rock until the noise kicked in. He strolled toward his father. What are you doing? I thought I'd pull these out of mothballs and put them to use. I think the guests will enjoy them, don't you? He held up one ring with an enameled hummingbird attached and another fashioned from a seashell. The women will. Since they're the ones who usually choose this kind of place, their approval is what matters. One of the lessons I've learned through the years is that as long as you keep the ladies happy, it's smooth sailing. Speaking of ladies, I hear ya. Have fun with that. Eric waved a hand toward the collection. I'm gonna run up and talk to BJ for a minute. She's not here. He halted and swung back. Not the news he wanted to hear. Where is she? On her way to Coos Bay. It seems the plumbing subcontractor is dragging his feet. She said she was gonna light a fire under him. And based on the fire in her eyes, I expect she'll succeed. Hey, remember this one? His father held up a seagull made of feathers. He grimaced. How could I forget? Mom almost scalped me after I used those for target practice in the backyard the year you guys gave me the BB gun for my birthday. I didn't know there were any survivors. This one must have escaped the firing squad. His dad chuckled. Want it as a souvenir? I'll pass. It does not evoke happy memories. I bet my guests will appreciate it, though, and the story behind it. Going for laughs at my expense, huh? Anything to keep my patrons entertained. His dad winked and put the ring back in the pile. There's a message from Rose Marshall on the kitchen counter for you. She wants to know if you'll review her personal documents, will, power of attorney, that sort of thing, to ensure they're up to date. Apparently, some acquaintance just had a major accident, and she wants to get her house in order. Good grief. Clients were coming out of the woodwork. What did you tell her? That I'd pass on the message. I didn't make any promises. What did you decide to do about our friend from church? I'm gonna take the job. I could do it in my sleep, and the pay rate is higher than I expected for small-town legal work. High enough to tempt you? To do what? Stay? Eric shoved his hands in his pockets. That's not my plan, Dad. Plans can change. I've put a lot of years into mine. It's not easy to alter your course midstream. No one ever said life was easy. Besides, taking the easy route doesn't always lead to the best views. That sounds like something Charlie would say. A 
I'm flattered. He's a smart man. He gingerly picked up a frou-frou woodland fairy napkin ring and dangled it from his finger at arm's length. What's your verdict on this one? Eric pretended to gag. Yeah, I'm with you. What was your mother thinking? He shook his head and set it down. I left some quiche in the oven for you. Help yourself. Thanks. Eric wandered into the kitchen and picked up the message his dad had left on the counter. If work like this kept falling into his lap, it would almost be a job. Almost. But even if there was sufficient work to sustain him, practicing law in Hope Harbor wouldn't lead to the kind of success he'd envisioned. Only a big city partner track job would do that. Hope Harbor, however, would provide a better quality of life and allow him to deepen his relationship with BJ. Too bad the two options were mutually exclusive. While he retrieved his breakfast from the oven, the hammering upstairs resumed at full force. Fitting. It matched the sudden pounding in his head as he struggled with the choices before him. Because the direction he chose in the coming days could change his life forever. Was that? Luis stopped on Eleanor's front porch and sniffed the aroma wafting through the open windows. No. It couldn't be. Morosi Cristianos, could it? He sniffed again, the distinctive aroma transporting him back to the land of his birth, to happy times spent with family and friends. But how would Eleanor know about that? And where would she have learned to cook such a dish? All at once, the door opened as if she'd been watching for him through the sidelight windows. Good evening, Louise. She gave him a tentative smile. Please, come in. Good evening. He stepped inside, skirting Methuselah as he held out the small box of chocolate truffles he'd purchased. For you. My, her hand fluttered to her chest. What a thoughtful gesture. These are my favorites. She took the box. I know. I asked BJ what you might like. You didn't have to do this. They're very pricey. A special occasion splurge. A guest always brings a gift. My mother taught me this when I was a young boy. She must have had admirable manners. Yes, we were not rich, but she was a lady. Well, she motioned him toward the back of the house. Why don't we visit in the kitchen while I finish dinner? After setting the box of candy on the tray attached to the front of her walker, she led the way. He followed, pausing on the threshold of the room. A bright yellow cloth draped the table, which had been set with china, cloth napkins, and gleaming silver. Cut crystal glasses filled with water were at each place, and fresh flowers overflowed from a vase in the center. His throat tightened. You have gone to much trouble. Not at all. She waved a hand and continued toward the stove. I like to cook. Your visit gave me an excuse to prepare a real meal again. I hope you like black beans and rice. Bendiga mi alma. The aroma was Morosi Cristianos. It is one of my favorite foods. He choked out the words, steadying himself on the back of a chair. I've never made it until today, but I understand it's a popular dish in your country. I hope it's edible. She smoothed a hand down her slacks. If it's not, I also have Palpita Cubana with hard-boiled eggs and olives. Her pronunciation was off, but Louise had no problem understanding what she'd said. I also like meatloaf. My mother cooked it on special days. You are very kind. A flush rose on her cheeks. I try to please my guests. If you'll help me set out the food, we're ready to eat. Louise carried the dishes to the table under Eleanor's direction, then assisted her as she took her seat. Once he was in his chair, she folded her hands. 
I know we come from different religious backgrounds, but I always pray before meals. It is good to give thanks. And while we do not go to the same church, we honor the same God. I do not think he will mind if we share a simple prayer. He bowed his head and made the sign of the cross. After a moment, Eleanor spoke. Thank you, Lord, for this food and this opportunity for Luis and me to get acquainted. Open our hearts to your will and help us make the right decision about BJ's proposal. Please bless us with health and abundant grace. Amen. Amen, Luis echoed her as he crossed himself again. Help yourself. Don't be shy. There's enough here to feed an army. Eleanor swept a hand over the food and took a slice of meatloaf. So, tell me how you're liking Hope Harbor now that you've been here a few months. It is a beautiful place, and I have been shown much kindness. He spooned out a hearty helping of the black beans and rice, inhaling the savory scent of garlic. It must be very different than your homeland. The weather and plants and customs are different, yes. But I am adopting, he frowned. That is the proper word? I think you mean adapting. Yes, I am adapting. He shoveled in a mouthful of rice and beans, the salty flavor of ham, the kick of onions and green peppers, the earthy tang of cumin exploding on his tongue. He closed his eyes, savoring the taste of home. Is it good? At the anxious note in Eleanor's voice, he met her gaze. It is better than good. It is maravilloso. I'm glad you like it. She took a helping herself. BJ told me about your medical background and the barriers to practicing medicine here. I'm sorry. That must be a disappointment. It was, but even that heartache couldn't ruin his enjoyment of this wonderful meal. I miss medicine, yes. I studied very long to help the sick. But I see the need for passing many tests to get a license. I was lucky to have another skill to earn money. You passed many tests in Cuba to be a doctor, didn't you? Yes but they meant nothing here. I hope someday you can practice medicine again. No. Being a doctor here, it is too hard. But there is a paramedic program at the college, and Luis pressed his lips together. Why had he brought that up? No one but Eric and whoever had requested the material knew about the information he'd received. Talking about unrealistic dreams was foolish. Go on, Eleanor leaned forward encouragingly. No, he pushed it from his mind and took another helping of beans and rice. It will not be possible for many years, and only if it is in God's plan. Now I work in construction. He lifted his heaping fork in salute. The food is delicioso. Taking his cue, she let the subject drop. She did ask many more questions during the meal, though, and he asked a few of his own. By the time she retrieved a plate of homemade pastelitos for dessert, he had no qualms about signing on for the pilot program BJ wanted to run. Yet as he bit into one of the flaky, jam-filled turnover pastries, he was less certain about Eleanor. She'd gone above and beyond in her efforts to welcome him to her home, and she couldn't have been more hospitable during the meal. But there was a certain restraint in her manner that suggested she harbored doubts. That did not bode well for the outcome. When they finished, however, she surprised him. While I load the dishwasher, why don't you go upstairs and take a look at the two rooms that would be yours if we decide to pursue BJ's proposal? I haven't been up there since I've been saddled with that nuisance. She flicked a hand at the walker, an expression of disgust contorting her face. So ignore the dust. I will help you first. No, you're a guest tonight. 
There are many chores I can't do these days, but kitchen duties aren't a problem. Besides, I enjoy puttering around out here, especially when I have the chance to cook a real meal. Go on up and poke around. No need to hurry. This will take me a few minutes. I'll meet you in the living room once I finish. He acquiesced with a nod. Although he'd prefer to help with the cleanup, it was also important to respect turf and preserve pride. After making his way back through the living room, he ascended the stairs to the second floor of the cozy Cape Cod house. The two rooms off the small landing were each about nine by twelve. There was also a full bath. Both rooms were furnished, one featuring a queen-size bed, the other a couch. All the furniture was covered with sheets, and while the rooms were as dusty as Eleanor had warned, this was a palace compared to Sea Haven Apartments. No matter what Eleanor expected of him in return, no matter how much maintenance and caregiving work she required, he was ready to sign on the dotted line. But was she? He lingered in the rooms, as she'd requested, trying to figure out which way this might go. In the end, however, all he could do was put the outcome in God's hands and hope for the best. He was every bit as nice as BJ had said he was. Eleanor stacked the dishes in the dishwasher, rinsing by road as she tried without success to find one negative about the man who'd shared her table. As far as she could see, he would be a dream companion. He was considerate, respectful, polite, articulate, and imbued with a quiet dignity. She finished loading the dishes and ran a finger over the small box of truffles on the counter. Based on the frugal life BJ said he led, this had been a huge extravagance. He must be very interested in moving in with her. And who could blame him, based on the dismal, bare-bones accommodations BJ had described? Anything would be a step up from that. He would reap huge benefits from this arrangement. But she would, too. She gave the room a critical sweep. A piece of wallpaper was beginning to peel in the corner, and the baseboards could do with a fresh coat of paint. Another door had begun to stick. The outside needed work, too. Old houses required constant attention, and more energy than she had these days. The place was getting away from her. But with Luisa's assistance, she ought to be able to stay on top of things. Plus, having someone on hand to fetch and carry and run errands would be a godsend. You could only impose on friends so long before the friendship began to wear thin. Rose was an angel, but she had other obligations too. Best of all, though, if Luis were here, she would no longer have to eat dinner alone with just Methuselah for company. He was a great cat, but not much of a conversationalist. Eleanor gripped her walker, shifted it toward the living room, and pushed toward her chair, decision made. As she settled in, Luis appeared in the doorway. The rooms are nice. Have a seat. She waved him toward the couch at a right angle to her chair. In silence, he crossed the room, perched on the edge of the sofa, and waited. If we can come to an agreement about expectations, duties, and responsibilities, I'm willing to give this a try. What do you think? The emotions parading across his face weren't difficult to read. Disbelief, relief, gratitude, and hope. I think, his words scraped out, and he swallowed. I think... I would like to try this too. You realize I'll expect help with household chores, uh, maintenance, errands, those kinds of duties? Yes, BJ told me how it would work. I would be happy to do all those things for a nice place to live and home-cooked meals. I can provide both of those. She played with a loose thread on the arm of her chair, debating how much more to say, how much risk to take. But in the end, she spoke what was in her heart. I can also provide friendship, Louise, if all of this works out as I hope. 
living a solitary life can be lonely. Yes, he focused on his clasped hands. I, too, have been lonely. More than she, no doubt, given all he'd lost and his new life among strangers. If we're in agreement, I'll call BJ tonight and let her know we want to proceed. I believe Eric will draw up some paperwork for us to sign. Do you have any other questions for me? No, I cannot think of any. I am too... My heart is too full. Pressure built behind her eyes and she blinked it away. It's been a long day of cooking for me, and I know you put in a full day of physical labor. Shall we call it a night? He rose at once. Yes, of course. I put together a package of leftovers for you to take home. You'll find it in the refrigerator. You do not have to, she held up a hand. No protests. I'll be eating the remains of our meal for a week as it is. There's plenty for both of us. After a brief hesitation, he retreated to the kitchen. While he was gone, she pushed herself to her feet and trundled over to the front door. Once he joined her in the hall, he stopped beside the door, cradling the leftovers in his hands as if they were as fragile and precious as her Waterford Christmas tree ornaments. May I speak from here? He placed his hand on his heart. She gripped her walker and dipped her head. When I came to this town, I did not think life would ever be happy again. I knew no one, and my soul was heavy with grief. That sadness has not gone away. But the kindness you and others have shown me has made it smaller. May God bless you for all you have done to help BJ with her program and for sharing your home with me. She nodded, unwilling to trust her voice. With a slight bow, he let himself out. As the door closed behind him, Methuselah wandered over to rub against her leg. She swallowed and slowly exhaled. What do you think of all this, my friend? He purred and trotted over to his favorite rug, a new spring in his step. Or was she imagining things? Probably. But as she returned to the kitchen to close up the house for the night, she wasn't imagining the new spring in her step. It was possible, of course, that once they were living under the same roof, one or both of them would decide the arrangement wasn't working and end it after the trial period. Yet deep inside, she couldn't help hoping that tonight was the beginning of a long and beautiful friendship. Chapter 22 Yes! Fingers trembling, BJ pressed the off button on her cell and clutched it to her chest. Eleanor and Louise were in. Sparing Tracy and Michael's in-progress house plans no more than a distracted glance, she left them behind and headed for the kitchen. If this news didn't merit the rest of that fudge cake she'd saved when she'd met with Eleanor, nothing did. After removing the treat from the freezer and nuking it to take the chill off, she poured herself a tall glass of milk, retrieved a fork, and sat down at the kitchen table to indulge. Halfway through the rich confection, a niggle of guilt prodded her conscience as she eyed the phone on the table beside her. She owed Eric a call in response to the text and voicemail messages he'd left during the past 12 hours while he'd been MIA. Where had he been all day anyway? Not that she wanted their paths to cross. After their exchange on the patio Sunday afternoon, it was much safer if their orbits didn't interact. Warmth flooded her cheeks just thinking about how close she'd come to crossing a dangerous line that day and inviting him to cross it. Thank goodness an incoming call had interrupted the charge scene. Sharing hugs that might end up going far beyond friendly would put her heart at major risk. However, ignoring his messages was rude. The man deserved an update on the Eleanor Louise situation. 
especially since he'd volunteered to put together the necessary paperwork. She finished her cake, picked up her cell, and tapped in his number. Halfway through the first ring, he picked up. I was beginning to think we were never going to connect. He sounded tired, but happy to hear from her. I'm not the one who disappeared all day. I, uh, had some things to do, and you were gone this morning. How did you fare with the plumbers? He didn't intend to tell her where he'd been. Fine, she could deal with that, even if it rankled for some reason. They'll be at the house Friday morning, early. A chuckle came over the line. Dad said you'd get action. I've dealt with plenty of contractors. I know most of their stall tactics, and how to circumvent them. But I didn't call to talk about plumbing. I have good news. Eleanor and Luis hit it off. Yes, they're ready to sign on the dotted line. I'm glad I got a head start on the boilerplate agreement. No surprise that a go-getter like him would take the initiative and dive in. How close is it to being ready? Very. I'll make a few final tweaks tonight and email it over for your review. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. Once it's finalized, all we'll need to do is personalize it for their situation. I could meet with them tomorrow night after Luis gets off work, if that fits with everyone's schedule. I'll talk to both of them, but I can't imagine either has a pressing commitment. Why don't you plan on seven, and if anything changes, I can let you know tomorrow at the house. I may not be around much, but you can text or call me. Another disappearing act. What could he be up to? Sounds like you have a busy schedule. Yeah, um, another legal job came up. She had no reason to doubt that, but she had a feeling there was more to his absences than legal chores. Must be nice to have work fall into your lap. I guess, if you're in the market for work. That wasn't the purpose of my visit. However, I'm learning to go with the flow. You'll be there tomorrow night, right? Yes. If the program gets the nod, future paperwork will be overseen by helping hands. But this is my baby for now. That's what I assumed. I'll see you there. No offer to swing by and pick her up. It's safer this way, BJ, she thought to herself. True. But that didn't mitigate her twinge of disappointment. Okay, enjoy the rest of your evening. She prepared to hang up. Wait, I have a question for you. After all your work on the sets for the musical, you're going to one of the shows this weekend, aren't you? Yes, and I almost forgot to tell you, there'll be a comp ticket at the door for you, usable for any of the performances. Which night are you going? Friday, unless I get hung up at your dad's with the plumber. Want to go together? Despite a surge of pulse-elevating adrenaline, she hesitated. The more time she spent in his company, the more difficult it would be to cope after he left. But he might show up Friday night anyway. It was silly not to sit together, and it would be a safe environment. What could happen in an auditorium full of people? Why don't I meet you there? Whoever gets there first can save a seat. That seemed like a reasonable compromise. I suppose that will work. He didn't sound happy about it, however. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow at breakfast. I doubt it. I need to stop in at Grace Christian and take some detailed measurements for the remodel job that's next on the schedule. Breakfast will be over before I arrive. A beat of silence passed. Are you avoiding me, BJ? He would ask a direct question like that. I told you, I have a meeting at Grace Christian. I mean in general. Of course he did. I lead a busy life, Eric. He muttered some phrase she didn't catch. Look, I'm a lawyer, remember? Trained to spot evasive maneuvers. I thought we agreed to be honest with each other. She pressed a finger against one of the chocolate crumbs on her plate and popped it in her mouth, but it didn't help sweeten what she needed to say. We did. She took a deep breath and plunged in. The truth is, I like you a lot. 
Too much in view of the high probability that one day soon you're going to leave Hope Harbor and me behind. I don't want another broken heart, and that would be a given if our relationship escalates. Even if I leave, there might be a way to... No, she swallowed, clamped her fingers around the edge of the table, and said what she had to say. I don't want to fall for a man who puts career above everything else. I know what the partner track demands, and it doesn't leave time or energy for much else. That's not the kind of life or relationship I want. A sigh came over the line. I figured that's how you felt after our... on Sunday. There's one thing you need to know, though. Your heart isn't the only one in danger here. Nice to hear, even if it wasn't likely to change the outcome. But your career is more important. I didn't say that. The truth is, I want it all. That's not how life plays out for most people. We have to make choices, let go of things that aren't as important to get the things we want most. Assuming you know what those are. You'll work it out, Eric, sooner or later. I'd prefer sooner. Patience is a virtue. I haven't mastered that one yet. But I've got diligence down pat, and I'm not bad at humility. Although his teasing tone seemed forced, it lightened up the conversation. Better. She didn't want to end this exchange on a heavy note. Speaking of diligence, I'll let you get to those boilerplate tweaks you mentioned. Check for the document in about an hour. See you tomorrow night and sleep well. You too. But as she ended the call and cleared the table, she had a feeling that during the long night to come, restful slumber was going to prove as capricious and elusive as true love. BJ looked exhausted. As the lights went up for the intermission of Oklahoma, Eric examined her profile. Since their meeting at Eleanor's on Wednesday night to finalize all the paperwork, faint shadows had appeared beneath her lower lashes, and the fine creases at the corners of her eyes had deepened. If he hadn't been spending every spare moment at Charlie's studio, he'd have noticed her fatigue sooner. So what held you up? He angled toward her. All she'd offered as she'd slid into her seat while the lights dimmed for the overture was a murmured, Sorry, I'm late. She shifted her attention from the program to him. I had an errand after work that ran long. You feeling okay? Yes, why? You look like you've been working too hard. Or are toying with a relapse of whatever bug you had. No relapse. She closed the program. It's been busy, though. I spent last night after work at Eleanor's cleaning the upstairs so Luis won't have to contend with layers of dust before he can go to bed tomorrow night. That wasn't part of the deal. I didn't mind. She shrugged off the frown he aimed at her. And I don't have any plans to repeat it. They'll be on their own once he moves in. I just want this to get off on the right foot. You take on too much. I could have tapped you to help me clean the bathroom, I guess. <laughs> I bet you'd have loved that. She shot him a teasing grin. If you'd asked, I might have volunteered. I haven't seen you to ask. I've been busy. So you've been saying. She waited, giving him a chance to expound, but he wasn't ready to admit he'd been doing some serious painting. Fortunately, several members of the audience interrupted their exchange to compliment him on the backdrop. He stood to greet them, and as he chatted, BJ rose and wandered off. His spirits nosedived. Could she be leaving? Would she text him in a few minutes to say she was tired and had decided to go home? Before he could call out to her, she disappeared into the milling throng. Short of being rude, he couldn't ignore the cluster of people around him. But as the group thinned at last, she reappeared, juggling two disposable cups and a napkin wrap packet. Relief flooded through him. And when another guy stepped up, he prepared to dispense with him quickly. At this rate, the lights would go down again and he'd have no chance to talk to BJ. Steve Davis, nice job on the backdrop. The man extended his hand and Eric returned his firm clasp. Thanks. 
He sent a pointed glance toward BJ, who was edging down the row past a brigade of knees toward their seats. If the guy had any people skills, he'd get the hint. Steve followed his line of sight. I won't keep you, but I do have a favor to ask. I'm on the city council, and I heard through the grapevine that you've temporarily hung out a shingle. We've got some urgent zoning proposals that need a legal review, and we'd appreciate your input. We used to have Rick Jensen on retainer for this kind of work, but after he retired, we never got around to lining up a new contact. It was raining work in this town. At this rate, he wasn't going to have a chance to finish his painting before he left. I understand you're here on vacation, so if it's an imposition, I'll tell you what. No reason to leave ill will behind, and it sounded like the council was in a bind. Why don't I swing by City Hall and see what you have? If it's not too involved, I'm sure I can fit it in. That would be great. And thanks again for pitching in behind the scenes here. Steve waved toward the stage in the packed auditorium. You have real talent. While the man returned to his seat, BJ sank back into hers, holding up a cup. Lemonade was the only beverage at the concession stand. Perfect. He sat too and sipped the tangy drink. Take your pick. She opened the napkin to display several cookies. You choose first. Not necessary. I like them all. He selected an oatmeal raisin. What's on your agenda for tomorrow? I told Luis I'd haul his stuff over to Eleanor's. She set the bundle in her lap and picked up a chocolate chip cookie. He's not wasting any time, is he? Would you, if you lived in that dump? True. You need some help? I don't think so. He said he only had a few boxes, mostly clothes. She broke off a piece of cookie, her expression troubled. It's sad how little he has to show for his life, considering all he's done. I can't imagine how difficult it must be to face every new day knowing the people and work you love are gone forever. How does a person cope with that kind of loss? Sometimes by taking desperate measures, or trying to but that secret would remain between Luis and him. Having a decent place to live might lift his spirits. I hope so. Let's pray the four-week trial period works out well for both of them. The lights blinked, signaling the end of the too short intermission. You need to help me finish these. She handed him another cookie. I never turned down cookies. He gave her a smile. She returned it but the curve of her lips was perfunctory rather than sincere. Understandable. She'd warned him she didn't want to get involved, had been honest about her feelings and her fears. Keeping him at arm's length was the prudent course. Too bad he couldn't reach for her hand, twine his fingers with hers and offer her the assurance she needed to feel comfortable about moving forward, Instead, as the lights went out and the orchestra launched into the entreact, he kept his hands occupied with lemonade and cookies. Because despite the doubts that had begun to surface with alarming regularity, he wasn't yet ready to admit that maybe, just maybe, it might be time to change the course he'd set on the day he'd applied to law school 14 long years ago. She needed a taco. She also needed a shower. BJ braked at the intersection in downtown Hope Harbor. Straight would take her home. A left would take her to the wharf. Her stomach growled. Decision made. She flipped on her blinker and hung a left. Five minutes later, after finding a parking spot near Charlie's, despite the Saturday tourist rush, she joined the queue at a stand. Inching toward the window, she inhaled the aroma of sizzling fish and savory spices. Morning, or should I say afternoon? Charlie smiled as she approached the window. No matter the crowd, he never appeared to be in a rush. Yet for some odd reason, the line always advanced at a reasonable pace. It's definitely afternoon, and I'm hungry. One order coming up, or is someone else joining you? Nope, I'm having a solo lunch. By choice. 
Eleanor had invited her to stay and eat after all of Luis's boxes had been hauled in, but it was better to let the two of them settle in without a third party hanging around. Well, Floyd and Gladys will help keep you company. He waved a spatula toward two seagulls perched on the boulders that sloped down to the water. She peered at the two birds. As near as she could tell, they were identical to the dozen others in the vicinity. But if he said so... I think I'll take the food home and enjoy it on my patio. Not a bad idea. Maybe Casper will join you. She blinked. Had she ever mentioned Casper during their chats? Not that she recalled. But it could have slipped out somewhere along the way. How else would he know her pet name for the companionable seal on Little Gull Island? He might. Did you get Louis set up in his new digs at Eleanor's? You heard about that already? He flashed his white teeth. You wouldn't believe how much I hear and see from this counter. I don't doubt that. I bet you could write a book. Not on my bucket list. Now, Luis, he could write a book. Yeah, I hope this arrangement works out for both of them. I have a feeling it will. Those two will be good for each other. They gave a pan of onions and peppers a shake. What's Eric up to now that he's done with the backdrop? She dipped her chin and pulled some bills out of her pocket. I haven't seen a lot of him since then. I heard he's taken on some legal work. He flipped the fish and began to line up the corn tortillas. Yes, but not enough to account for his long absences from the house. If he was making himself scarce, however, she had no one to blame but herself. He was simply respecting the boundaries she'd set. It would be nice if he stayed on in Hope Harbor. Charlie sprinkled some kind of seasoning on the sizzling vegetables in the pan. Wouldn't it, though? I don't think that's in his plans. Might be, if there was sufficient motivation. He piled the tortillas high with filling, added a dollop of sauce to each, and deftly folded them over. Like what? She laid her money on the counter and sent him a wary look. Oh, I don't know. He wrapped the tacos in white paper and slipped them in a brown bag. I suppose it would help if he had a personal reason to stay. He met her gaze as he slid the bag across the counter and picked up the money. Sheesh. Now Charlie was playing matchmaker? Should she pretend she didn't know what he meant, or take advantage of the man's counsel, which had proven wise in the past? She checked over her shoulder. For once, there was no line behind her. Why not see what he had to say? I tried to give him one. She kept her voice low in case someone appeared. But I don't want to put too much pressure on him. I'd rather he make his decision based on what he wants rather than what I want. Do you think he's clear about what you want, though? She opened her mouth to reply in the affirmative. Closed it. Maybe not. Yes, she'd been upfront about her attraction to him, but she'd never admitted that the notion of marriage had begun to creep into her thoughts, assuming all continued to go well. Nor had she admitted it to herself, until now. Marriage was a gigantic step, and it was much too soon to suggest to him that was where she hoped they might be heading. Besides, you could scare a man off by bringing up the M-word this early in a relationship. Because a man would have to have a powerful reason to rethink the dream of his youth. And there's nothing as powerful as a human connection. Charlie picked up on his previous comment as if there'd been no gap in the conversation, then eased sideways to greet some new arrivals. Be with you in a minute, folks. BJ grabbed the bag and her change and took a step back. Thanks for the food and the food for thought. He offered her a mock salute, his grin back in place. No charge for the latter. Bag in hand, BJ wandered back to her truck and swung up into the driver's seat. A lot of what Charlie had said made sense. But what if she told Eric she was thinking long term about them? He changed his life for her and the relationship fell apart. 
That would add to the boatload of guilt she already carried. Dodging the traffic on Dockside Drive, she kept a firm grip on the wheel and her emotions. She needed to make the correct call on this, whatever that turned out to be. And since she was clueless about how to proceed, she'd better put some heavy-duty prayer at the top of her priority list until she got the direction she needed. Chapter 23 What's going on with you and BJ? Eric set his laptop on the kitchen table and plugged it in while he responded to his father. What do you mean? She skipped out on my breakfasts three days in a row. He pushed a button on the dishwasher, folded his arms, and leaned back against the counter. I don't think my culinary skills are the culprit. Louise and Stone haven't had a problem polishing off any of the food I've made. Why do you think it has anything to do with me? I haven't even seen her for five days. Eric busied himself powering up the laptop. Silence. When he slid a glance toward the sink, his father was watching him with the let's cut the bull look he'd employed whenever his wayward son had tried to finagle out of responsibility for some transgression. The look that said he knew exactly what was going on, whether Eric admitted it or not. Not. He turned his attention to his email. After I finish with this, I'm gonna go over to... His phone began to vibrate. Saved by the buzz. He pulled out the cell, hesitated over the unfamiliar name on the screen, pressed talk. Better to converse with a stranger than play bob and weave with his dad. Eric Nash? Yes. Carol Richter. As she named the company she represented, his eyebrows rose. Everyone in the legal business had heard of that top-notch recruiting firm. If you have a few minutes, I'd like to discuss an opportunity with you. I spoke with an attorney at your previous firm who wasn't interested in making a move, but he gave me your name and number. Yes, I have time. He checked on his father, who'd gone back to puttering around the kitchen. He listened as she described a partner track position at one of the premier law firms in Seattle, a firm larger and more prestigious than the one he'd been affiliated with in Portland. Only top-tier candidates are being considered. I can tell you that the salary and benefits are commensurate with or better than those at your previous firm. And this is a fast-track position. The expectation is that whoever is put in this job will be made partner in six to 12 months. As she concluded, Eric leaned back in his chair, nerves thrumming. This was exactly what he'd worked to achieve all these years. I'm interested. Excellent. I'll email you some additional information. They'd like to fill this ASAP. Assuming you find the material to your liking, would you be available to interview on Monday? That was fast. But he had no commitments that would prevent him from taking a trip to Seattle. Yes. Good. Expect my email in the next 20 minutes. If you could get back to me by noon tomorrow, I'd appreciate it. No problem. After they said their goodbyes, Eric slipped the phone back in his pocket. It was a very one-sided conversation. Keeping his face averted, Eric tapped a finger against the polished oak table. Unless the information the woman sent contained some unacceptable fine print, he was going on this interview. Since his dad would soon find that out anyway, why keep it a secret? He swiveled around. It was a recruiter. Ah, his father strolled over, mug of coffee in hand, and took a seat. I'm not surprised. Someone with your experience and skill wasn't going to languish for long. Is the job a fit? Yeah. He told him about the firm and the fast track to partner. Sounds like everything you always wanted. His father sipped his coffee, watching him with that discerning gaze of his. Eric tried not to squirm. His dad was right about this job dovetailing perfectly with his goals, but now that the initial ego boost excitement was dissipating, he wasn't as thrilled as he should be, as he wanted to be which was more than a little disconcerting. I think it has potential. He tried to inject a healthy dose of enthusiasm into his response. 
I guess you'll be doing the interview. Yes, unless I find a deal breaker in the material she's sending, which is doubtful. Well, his father rose. It's been nice having you around, even if the visit was shorter than I hoped. I haven't been offered the job yet. You will be. It'd be crazy not to grab you. And that's not just your father talking. You're smart and practical and articulate. You have excellent credentials and experience, and your work ethic is second to none. My guess is by this time next week, you'll have an offer. That might be ambitious. I don't think so. He smiled, but there was a touch of melancholy in it. At least Seattle isn't as far away as New York or Chicago, where you could have ended up. Maybe you can get home a little more often in the future. There will always be a room for you at Seabird Inn. Dad, it's not a done deal. He fought back an odd surge of panic. Only a matter of time. He rinsed his mug and set it in the sink. I need to run a few errands. Will you be home this afternoon? No. If his stay here was coming to a close, he needed to put as many hours as possible into his painting or he wouldn't finish it before he left. I'll see you later this evening, then. His father headed for the attached garage. Once he left, silence descended in the house, until the usual commotion began upstairs. No wonder his dad ran a lot of errands during the day. He powered down his laptop, closed the lid, and carried it toward the living room to stow with the rest of his stuff. At the foot of the stairs, however, he paused. BJ would be up there by now. Should he tell her about the call? No. Why not wait until he reviewed the material the recruiter sent, in case this fell through? Bad chance, Nash. Yeah, yeah, he knew that. Nevertheless, he continued to the living room, grabbed his jacket, and ducked out to spend the day painting. Later, after the house was quiet and BJ was gone, he'd tackle some of the legal work he'd taken on and review the material the recruiter was sending. He could tell BJ about the interview in a day or two. Coward, he thought. He slid behind the wheel of the BMW and jabbed the key in the ignition. Okay, fine. He didn't want to have a discussion that would prove her fears were valid and cause her to back off even farther. Besides, a lot of pieces had to fall into place before he walked away from Hope Harbor. An excellent interview, a firm offer on the table, agreeable terms, including a definitive timeline for partner. Only then would he have to make a decision about whether to accept the job. And until that moment arrived, he wanted to hold on to the pipe dream that he could have it all, no matter how foolish or unrealistic that was. Let's call it a wrap for today, guys. BJ pulled off her baseball cap and swiped the sleeve of her t-shirt across her forehead. It was downright stuffy in John's upstairs, and she had places to go on this sunny Friday afternoon. Stone and Luis began to collect their tools and clean up while she evaluated the status of the job. All that remained were a few finishing touches. They ought to wrap up by the end of next week, assuming the plumber stuck to the schedule he'd laid out. The painters could move in after that, still allowing John ample time to decorate and furnish the rooms in advance of his projected opening. It's coming along nice, Stone gave the room a cursory sweep, picked up his lunch pail and headed for the door. Yeah, it is. See you Monday. He lifted a hand in farewell. She waited until his footsteps sounded on the stairs, then crossed to Luis. Everything going okay at Eleanor's? So far, so well. He twisted his wrist to check his watch. Do you need me to do anything else? No, we're done. You in a hurry? Eleanor, she is making a rose con pollo, rice and chicken tonight. She goes to much trouble for our meals. I do not want to be late, and I promise to stop at the market on the way home. She needs groceries, and there is some medicine to pick up. It appeared they were both trying hard to make a success of their new living arrangement. If the setup continued to work well, she should have no problem convincing the Helping Hands board that the companion program would be an excellent addition to the organization's services. 
I won't keep you. Go ahead and enjoy your dinner. I am sure I will. He took off to, leaving her alone in the suite. She wandered over to the window that offered a panoramic view of the harbor and distant horizon, thanks to the house's hilltop location. John's guests would enjoy their stay here. It was a perfect setting for relaxation, rejuvenation, and romance. Sighing, she turned away from the picturesque vista. As far as she could see, there was no romance on her horizon. She'd been clear about the kind of relationship she wanted and didn't want. And Eric had apparently decided the demanding partner track was more appealing than a less stressful life in Hope Harbor. And an architect who called the town home. On the other hand, she'd never told him directly about the depth of her feelings. A man would have to have a powerful reason to rethink the dream of his youth. And there's nothing as powerful as a human connection. As Charlie's words echoed in her mind, she massaged the sudden throb above the bridge of her nose. Maybe she ought to be honest. Tell him that despite their short acquaintance, she was falling in love with him. That she wanted to give their relationship a chance, to tap the potential she was certain it held. But what if he gave up everything and the two of them fizzled? She was back to square one. Huffing out of breath, she flipped off the light in the suite and trudged down the corridor. Perhaps the brief spur-of-the-moment getaway she'd planned would bring her some clarity and help her build up the courage to bear her heart. Besides, why rush the process? After all, what could happen to change the status quo in a mere handful of days? You want to tell me what's going on? At the out of the blue question, Eric angled away from his easel to find Charlie watching him, paintbrush in hand. He had a feeling the man had been observing him for a while. What are you talking about? You've been painting like you're in some kind of race for the past two days. What gives? What time is it? Close to 4.30. I'm getting ready to mosey over to the wharf and cook for the Friday night crowd. Where's your watch? I took it off last night and forgot to put it back on. That doesn't sound like you. I have a lot on my mind. I'm picking that up. I'll repeat my earlier question. What gives? Stealing himself, he set his brush in the container of solvent beside him. He couldn't put off telling Charlie about his trip any longer. I have an interview Monday with a law firm in Seattle. I'll be leaving early tomorrow morning, driving to my condo in Portland and continuing to Seattle Sunday. You apply for this job? No. He gave Charlie a condensed version of how it had come about. On paper, the position appears to be tailor-made. I was trying to finish this by today. He tapped the edge of his canvas. But I'm not going to make it. Hmm. His mentor twirled his brush between his fingers. You planning to leave another unfinished painting to clutter up my studio? I don't have the job yet. You will. I wish I was as certain of that as you and my dad are. Are you? He furrowed his brow. What's that supposed to mean? Think about it. He stood. So are you going to finish that or not? He waved toward the canvas. I hope so. Me too. He cleaned his brush in some solvent. I'm gonna take a shower and go feed some folks. If I don't see you before you leave, have a safe trip. Aren't you gonna wish me luck? Charlie ambled over to the turntable and lifted the needle, shutting off the mellow jazz strains of Stan Getz. Luck is an overrated commodity. I'll wish you success at finding your destiny instead. Turn off the lights and lock up as usual when you leave. Without waiting for a reply, he walked out of the studio, closing the door with a soft click behind him. Silence descended. And all at once, the air in the studio felt flat, as if every volt of energy had been sucked out of the room. Eric examined his painting again, picked up the brush, put it back. The motivation to finish was gone. 
Besides, he wouldn't be able to manage that, no matter how late he worked tonight. And he had a lot of driving ahead of him in the next two days, plus some prep work for the Seattle meetings. Better reserve some stamina for that. And for breaking the news to BJ about the interview. He couldn't put it off any longer. Perhaps he could catch her at the house before she closed up shop for the day. But by the time he cleaned up at the studio and got home, her truck was already gone from the street in front. So was Stone's rattletrap car. He did manage to snag Luis as the man was climbing on his motorbike. Hey, Luis, he opened his window and waved at him as he pulled up. Hello, Eric. He left the bike and crossed to the car. How's it going? Based on appearances, Eric could guess the answer. In the week he'd been at Eleanor's, Luis's eyes had lost some of their sadness. He'd also been upbeat in the exchanges Eric had initiated every couple of days. Things are better. I'm glad to hear that. Not unexpected, but it was reassuring to have it affirmed. I take it everyone's gone for the day? He motioned toward the house. Yes, but I forget my wallet and had to come back. He patted his back pocket. I think BJ had some place to go. She said we should all get an early start on our weekend. That was out of pattern behavior. As far as he could tell, on the days he'd been around at quitting time, she was always the last one out the door. Thanks. Tell Eleanor I said hello. I will be happy to. With a wave, he hurried back to his motorbike. Resting his hands on the steering wheel, Eric watched Luis rev the engine and roll down the street. Why not swing by BJ's, see if he could catch her at home? She might have stopped there before setting out for wherever she was going this evening. And the news he had was best delivered in person. He put the car in gear and wove through the town towards C. Rose Lane. But a hundred yards down her street, he slowed. Her truck wasn't in the driveway. She must already be gone, or might she have swung by Charlie's for dinner? Reversing direction, he returned to the center of town and drove down Dockside Drive, scanning the parked vehicles. BJ's truck wasn't among them. As he passed the taco stand, the aroma of grilling fish wafted into the car and his stomach rumbled. No surprise, since he'd painted through lunch instead of stopping to eat. But he wasn't up for another go-round with Charlie, much as he loved the man's tacos. Too bad his dad was meeting a friend for dinner, otherwise the two of them could have shared a pizza. He turned the corner and accelerated toward Main Street. The cafe wasn't a bad option for solo dining. After he grabbed a bite, he'd swing by BJ's again. Unfortunately, when he once again rolled down C. Rose Lane an hour later, there was still no sign of her truck. He pulled into her driveway, letting the engine idle while he tapped her number into his cell. If he could find out when she'd be home, they might be able to... The call rolled to voicemail. It figured. BJ, it's Eric. I'd like to see you tonight, or first thing in the morning. Let me know which would work better for you. Message sent. He pocketed the phone, backed out of her driveway, and steered the BMW toward home. Only if they couldn't connect before he left town would he resort to passing on his news by phone. But he'd rather see her face, touch her hand, reassure her that, what? He wasn't getting ready to leave Hope Harbor behind? Frowning, he stopped at the end of the street, verified there was no traffic either direction, and pulled out. What was he gonna tell her, beyond the fact that he'd scheduled a promising interview? That was no reassurance. She'd made her position clear. The life he was pursuing was the kind of life she'd left behind and no longer wanted. Nor did she want to get involved with a man who did. However, this whole trip north could be a bust, no matter what his dad or Charlie thought. He might have excellent credentials, but it was a given that everyone else Carol Richter had tapped for interviews did too. It was possible he'd be back in a few days with nothing on his agenda except finishing up the legal work he'd taken on and completing the painting waiting for him in Charlie's studio. And that was fine with him. While the job in Seattle sounded perfect, the timing wasn't. 
If his hand hadn't been forced, he'd have taken another week or two to think about what he wanted to do with the rest of his life, to weigh his options. So no matter what happened in the next few days, this was not a done deal. He still had decisions to make, all of which he needed to tell BJ before he left. Or he had a feeling one of the options he was weighing might no longer exist. Chapter 24 Getting away for 24 hours had been an inspired idea. BJ stepped out of the yurt she'd managed to snag in Sunset Bay State Park, thanks to a last-minute cancellation, and lifted her face to the sunny blue sky above. The small, domed, canvas wrap structure might be Spartan, but how better to disconnect from the world and clear the clutter from your mind than to spend a peaceful night nestled among old-growth forest. She strolled down the short path from the campground to a sandy beach protected by towering sea cliffs, energy bar in one hand, bottle of water in the other. One last look at the view, and she'd be ready to dive back into the real world. But her day off the grid had been profitable. With no electronics or house chores or work obligations or calls from helping hands to field, she'd had plenty of uninterrupted hours to think and pray and reflect on what Charlie had said to her last Saturday about Eric. And the Council of Hope Harbor's resident sage had been wise, as always. If a certain handsome attorney was searching for a compelling reason to stay, why not give him one? While she might not be able to offer any guarantees, their friendship would blossom into something deeper. Every instinct in her body told her it was headed in that direction. He needed to factor her conviction into his decision, assuming he returned her feelings. Given the warmth that filled his sable brown eyes whenever they were together, plus that comment he'd made about her heart not being the only one at risk, she was confident he did. Emerging onto the beach, she scanned the expanse of sea and sky and forest, letting the tranquility seep into her. She'd promised Eric honesty, and she'd keep that promise, trusting that if they were meant to be together, God would pave the way. After soaking up the calm for a few minutes and washing down the energy bar with her water, she returned to her yurt, packed up her sleeping bag and the few other items she'd brought, and pointed her car toward home and Eric feeling more relaxed than she had in weeks. Unfortunately, her newfound serenity was short-lived. Less than five minutes after she drove out of the park and powered up her cell, it rang, and a quick glance at the screen on the passenger seat goosed her pulse. Why was Eleanor calling? She let the call roll to voicemail as she maneuvered a curve on the two-lane road. Should she return the call now or wait until she got home? Now, if there was an issue with her prototype companion arrangement, better to deal with it than worry for the whole drive. As soon as she found a spot to pull off, she called Eleanor, who gave her a cheery greeting. That was a positive sign. She hoped. Hi, Eleanor, what's up? I'm not interrupting anything, am I? No, I was out of town last night, but I'm on my way back now. What can I do for you? Luis and I were wondering if you might have a few minutes to stop by this afternoon. We have a matter to discuss with you. Her stomach clenched. Is there a problem? I don't think so. But we'd like to talk with you in person. That wasn't too comforting. I should be back in town in about 40 minutes. Why don't I swing by your place before I go home? That would be perfect. We'll see you then. The line went dead. BJ blew out a breath. So much for her peace of mind. And since it was evaporating as rapidly as the cloud of billowing mist that had enveloped her car a few moments ago, she might as well check the rest of her voicemails in case anything else urgent had come up. When she tapped the icon, half a dozen messages popped up. Four of them were from Eric. The knot in her stomach tightened. Why had he been trying so hard to reach her? More negative vibes began to swirl around her as she listened to the first message. He'd wanted to see her last night or first thing this morning. 
The next two messages, one left much later last night, one early this morning, were similar. The fourth message explained the reason for his calls. He'd left this morning for a job interview in Seattle. Not one he'd sought, but the position met every criteria he'd hoped to find at a new firm. And no matter how much he downplayed his chances in the message, no matter his assurance he'd be back soon, he was going to get the job. Meaning his return to Hope Harbor would be brief. She gripped the top of the steering wheel, rested her forehead against her knuckles, and slowly exhaled. This was the outcome she'd expected all along. It was what he'd said from the beginning he was going to do. Hope Harbor's many charms might have caused him to waffle a bit while he was home, but the fact that he'd bolted for Seattle the instant he had a made-to-order opportunity told her everything she needed to know about his priorities. Swallowing past the lump in her throat, she sent him a quick text, tossed the phone back on the seat, and tried to prepare for whatever crisis awaited her at Eleanor's. Just got your messages. Good luck. Eric toweled his hair dry and frowned at the cryptic text from BJ that had come in while he was in the shower. Why hadn't she seen his messages until now, almost 24 hours after he'd sent the first one? Whatever the reason, they needed to talk, not exchange texts. Pressing his lips together, he called her number. It rolled to voicemail again. Was she tied up or avoiding him? Cell in hand, he prowled barefoot through the condo, eyeing the beige-toned contemporary furnishings that had once seemed stylish, but now struck him as bland and anonymous. There wasn't one item in this place that reflected his personality. Perhaps because he'd spent too little time here to ever put his stamp on it. He crossed the granite and steel kitchen, the tile chilling his bare feet as he set his cell on the counter. Nothing in this room was warm or welcoming either. It was night and day from BJ's kitchen, with its geometric art prints, framed prayer of St. Francis, and warm gray-blue walls that coordinated with the view of the sea out the windows. Nor was it anything like the house where he'd grown up, filled with touches that reflected the people who lived there, like woodland fairy napkin rings. If he got the job in Seattle, he'd be leaving this place, but not the lifestyle it represented, behind. Was that what he wanted? Sighing, he grasped the handle of the refrigerator where he'd stowed the takeout meal he'd picked up from his favorite. His phone began to vibrate against the granite on the countertop across the room. Another text from BJ? He raced over, snatched it up, and stared at the name of the sender. Charlie was texting him? The man who eschewed all modern electronics? Major disconnect. Last he'd heard, the Hope Harbor artist was still using one of those throwaway pay-by-the-minute cell phones. Archaic, but consistent with his preference for face-to-face -face social interactions. If he'd resorted to texting, the message must be important. Eric scrolled through the short paragraph. I sent a photo of your work in progress to one of my galleries yesterday. They'd like to see the piece when, if, it's finished. They get big bucks for paintings. Eric's jaw dropped. A high-end gallery wanted to see an attempt to sell his painting? He read Charlie's note again to verify his eyes hadn't been playing tricks on him. They hadn't. Wow. He stood there open-mouthed until the cold permeating the bottom of his feet became uncomfortable. Setting the phone on the counter, he snapped his jaw closed and gave the room a blank scan. Why had he come out to the kitchen again? Oh, yeah. He was going to nuke the takeout he'd picked up at his favorite Chinese place and prep for Monday's interview while he ate. But he wasn't hungry anymore. After grabbing his laptop, he moved into the living room, dropped into the leather chair in front of the TV where he reviewed case files during the rare waking hours he wasn't in the office, and powered up. He needed to forget about Charlie's text and focus on the interview. Except no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't. A high-end gallery wanted to see his painting if he finished it, as Charlie had been quick to point out. 
Wouldn't it be a kick if they offered to display it? And if they liked this one, if they sold it, might they be interested in others? He entered his password at the prompt and went back to daydreaming. An appropriate term. Because that's all this was. Selling art was a hit or miss proposition. There was zero security in it, even for an accomplished and respected artist like Charlie. If the confidences his mentor had shared about his income were true, he might make enough from his painting to provide the kind of life he wanted, but he had the taco stand to supplement those earnings, and that business was steady and reliable. A law practice in Hope Harbor could be too. Eric tapped a finger against the keyboard as that thought flashed through his mind. Could it? Perhaps. If the gallery did take his paintings and made an occasional sale, there might be sufficient legal work in Hope Harbor to pick up the slack in income. Not that any of the jobs he'd done in his hometown had generated the kind of money he was used to, but if he had enough of them, the revenue could add up to a tidy sum. Plus, according to Steve Davis, the town's previous attorney had been on retainer with the city. It was possible he could negotiate a similar arrangement. A few of the law firms in Coos Bay and Eugene might be interested in sending overflow jobs to an attorney with his credentials, too. It would be a balancing act, but it might work. There wouldn't be any high-profile cases or huge settlements in a Hope Harbor practice, but working one-on-one -on -one with the residents these past couple of weeks had been a lot more enjoyable than most of what he'd done in the world of corporate law. The cursor blinked at him, and he summoned up all of his powers of concentration. Despite the intriguing dual career option beginning to take shape in his mind, he was going on the interview. A life-altering decision like this shouldn't be made on the fly. Besides, the whole gallery thing could fall through. They might hate the finished piece, or they could take it only to have it languish. Yet if that happened, there were other galleries and life in Hope Harbor had a lot to recommend it. Not the least of which was a lovely architect who was fast stealing his heart. Louise had been busy. After shutting off the engine of her truck, BJ examined the walkway leading to Eleanor's front door. The once rippling stepping stones had been reset to provide a flat path for visitors instead of an ankle-threatening obstacle course. There was some new wood on the front steps, too, where rotted boards had been replaced. And if the sound of hammering in the back was any indication, Louise was busy on another project this Saturday afternoon. She climbed out of the car, dusting off some grains of sand clinging to the hem of her jeans. It would have been better to detour to the house first and shower, but... Waiting any longer to find out what was going on wasn't an option. Another half hour would have pushed her blood pressure into the danger zone. Pulse picking up, she climbed the refurbished steps and sent a silent plea heavenward. Please, Lord, if this is a glitch, help me find a way to smooth it out. It took two rings to summon Eleanor, who cracked the door a mere three inches. Hello, my dear. Methuselah is being a nuisance today, and I'm afraid if I open the door any farther, he'll scoot out. Hang on while I divert his attention. She shut the door. Half a minute later, her muffled voice came through the wood. The coast is clear, but make it fast. BJ inched open the door, sidled through, and clicked it shut behind her. Somehow Eleanor had herded the headstrong cat into the living room and when B.J. entered, he arched his back and gave her an indignant glare. Sorry, Methuselah, B.J. bent down to ruffle his ear. But we can't have you roam in the streets. The cat turned his back, patted to his favorite rug in the sun, and coiled into a ball. Goodness, what rude behavior. He's been out of sorts all week. I think he's miffed about having to share me with Luis. Is that a problem? Eleanor couldn't be rethinking the agreement based on her cat's disposition. Could she? Maybe for him, not for me. Have a seat and I'll let Luis know you're here. 
He's building a ramp from the back door to the patio so I can get out there more easily with my walker. He's a treasure. BJ's spirits lifted. If the arrangement wasn't working out, Eleanor wouldn't be praising the man, would she? Seconds after the older woman disappeared, the hammering outside stopped. Less than a minute later, both of them joined her in the living room. I'm sure you're wondering why we asked you to come here today. A flush rose on Eleanor's cheeks as she lowered herself into her recliner. Yes, the word hitched slightly. Eleanor looked over at Luis, who perched on the edge of a chair and gestured for her to continue. Well, she folded her hands in her lap. As anyone in town will tell you, I'm not an impulsive person. And as Luis and I have discussed, he isn't either. But during dinner last night, we both agreed our first week together has far surpassed our expectations. He has been a great blessing in my life already. And Eleanor in mine, Luis gave the older woman a gentle smile. She has made me feel very welcome and needed his hostess's color deepened. I felt needed, too, for the first time in a very long while. So we wanted you to know that even though we've only been at this a week, we'd like to adjust the legal agreement to make our arrangement permanent, or as permanent as anything can be when one of the parties is 88 years old. Methuselah lifted his head and gave a loud meow that sounded like a protest. I will win him over yet, Louise rose to stroke the grumpy feline's back. I have no doubt of that. You won me over by day two. A twinkle sparked in Eleanor's blue irises. So what do you think, BJ? Think? She was still trying to come to grips with this unexpected turn of events, Best case, she'd hoped they'd agree to an extension at the end of four weeks. The Helping Hands board wouldn't be satisfied with a model that didn't last several months, since the companion arrangements weren't intended to be short-term. But this? This was a gift from heaven. I think... I don't know what to think. I'm stunned, but also thrilled. This has worked out better than I could have ever imagined. We feel the same, don't we, Louise? Yes, God has been good. Eleanor pulled her walker close and stood. I think this calls for a celebration. BJ, will you stay and have some fudge cake or pastelitos or both? Both, she rose too. No counting calories today. Half an hour later, after sharing laughter and hugs, she said her goodbyes, patted a still sulking Methuselah, and retraced her route down the pristine pathway to her truck. Yet as she climbed behind the wheel and waved to the two people in the doorway who'd found renewed purpose in life, a wave of melancholy washed over her. This had been a day of surprises, some good, some bad. But she wasn't going to let the bad dim her joy for Eleanor and Luis. Their story appeared to be on track for a happy ending, even if hers wasn't. Chapter 25 Man, he was beat. Rotating his shoulders, Eric exited the high-rise Seattle office building where he'd just spent six intense hours. All he wanted to do after the grueling day of back-to-back -back interviews was return to Portland as fast as possible and crash at his condo. Instead, he was stuck here for two more nights. Clenching the handle of the overnight bag he'd retrieved from his car in the underground parking garage, he moved toward the curb. What could he have done except agree when one of the senior partners asked him to stay in town and meet with the head honcho over dinner tomorrow night after the man returned from meetings on the East Coast? As it was now, best case, he'd pull into Hope Harbor Wednesday afternoon, unless he wanted to drive straight through for eight hours after the dinner. Not a smart idea. 
He peered through the fog, searching for a cab as he tried to get a handle on his unsettled emotions. He should be elated, exhilarated, euphoric. The request to extend his stay meant he'd ace the interview. But disappointment trumped all those positive emotions for one simple reason. He didn't want to delay his return to Hope Harbor and BJ. A cab emerged from the mist, veering to the curb after he lifted his hand. He slid into the back seat, gave the address of the nearby hotel where the firm was putting him up, and leaned back against the cushions to check his messages. Maybe doing a routine chore would take the edge off his frustration. There were only two texts, one from his dad and one from BJ, sent mid-afternoon. Pulse picking up, he clicked on hers. I miss you, a lot. His throat tightened. In light of her recent withdrawal and reticence, those five words spoke volumes. Mood brightening, he tapped in a reply. Ditto, home Wednesday. Finger poised over the send button, he zoomed in on the word home. An interesting choice. He could have said back, or will return, or see you on, but he'd instinctively chosen home. Telling, and food for thought. The cab braked, and he braced himself as the car stopped inches short of clipping a bus that was pulling out from the curb. Close call. And the very reason he'd left his car in the office building garage instead of trying to drive through pea soup in an unfamiliar town. While the cabbie muttered under his breath, swerved around the bus, and picked up speed, Eric leaned back again. Brakes were a valuable asset, on cars and in life. Was it time to put the brakes on a career that had taken on a life of its own, leading him to a destination that no longer held the appeal it once had? Perhaps. Being plunged back into the frenetic world of high-stakes law for even one day had been a potent reminder of what awaited him if he was offered and took this job. Was that how he wanted to spend his days and evenings and weekends and holidays for the foreseeable future? The cab pulled up in front of the hotel six blocks from the law offices. After paying the bill, he stepped into the swirling fog that hid the tops of the high-rises around him and reduced street visibility. It was impossible to see very far ahead. He could relate. But that was no excuse for procrastination. Life didn't guarantee outcomes. In the end, you had to make your choices based on the information at hand and trust your heart. Ducking inside, he crossed the elegant lobby toward the registration desk, fingered the cell containing BJ's message, and made a decision. No matter the outcome of tomorrow's dinner, before he returned to Hope Harbor on Wednesday, he was going to sweep away the fog hanging over his future. And by the time he passed the welcome sign at the edge of town, he wouldn't know exactly what road he intended to follow in the days and years to come. Still no message from Eric. His three-word response to her text two days ago had been reassuring, but she'd hoped for more. Quashing her disappointment, BJ tucked her phone back in her pocket and descended the stairs in John's house. Her client met her at the bottom. I peeked into the suites while you were loading some stuff in your truck. They look ready to decorate. Close. We'll be out of your hair by the end of the week, taking our mess with us. The mess has been worth the payoff. And to tell you the truth, I'm gonna miss you and the crew. You liven things up around here. We'll miss you too. Not to mention your gourmet breakfasts. That was a great perk. You have an open invitation to drop by for breakfast any morning. Thanks. She fiddled with a hammer on her tool belt. Would John have any idea about the timing of Eric's return today? His son was staying here, after all, and the day was winding down. Um, I guess it's been quiet around the house with Eric gone. 
Not the smoothest transition, but it was the best she could come up with. Yes, after you all leave for the day anyway, he grinned. But I've gotten used to being on my own. Besides, I don't expect he'll be around much longer. So they were on the same page in their assumptions. Eric would be offered and accept the position in Seattle. No need for further discussion. Well, she pulled out her keys. I'll see you in the morning. Eggs Florentine are on the menu. Don't be late. I won't. See you then. She pushed through the front door into a heavy gray overcast that was a perfect match for her mood. But letting the weather get her down was ridiculous. Had she really expected her five-word message to change Eric's mind? Maybe the three-word message she'd been tempted to write would have had an impact. But it was too soon to throw the L word around, no matter what Charlie might think. Once behind the wheel, she switched on the wipers. For all the good they did in this soup. Visibility maxed out at 50 feet, with or without them. Fortunately, she didn't have far to go. And once she got home, she was going to put on some mellow music, change into her sweats, and try to chill. At the main intersection in town, however, she hesitated. Her cupboards needed restocking, and she wasn't in the mood to grocery shop or prepare a meal. Tacos would be tasty, but there wasn't much chance Charlie's would be open. The man was a literal fair-weather chef. If the sun didn't shine, he didn't cook. She continued straight on toward home. A can of soup or a scrambled egg would have to suffice, and either would satisfy her meager appetite. Fallout from Eric's voicemail Saturday about the interview. Eight minutes later, after pulling onto Sea Rose Lane, she slowed as she guided the truck through the thick fog. This was the biggest downside to her seaside cottage. It might be sunny half a mile inland, but shore property tended to catch all the clouds. On the flip side, there was nowhere else she'd rather be on a sunny day, and the fog often passed over quickly. In another few minutes, it might. She jammed on her brakes. Why was there a car in the driveway of the vacant house next to hers? And why did it remind her of Eric's BMW? Hard as she tried, she couldn't get a clear read on the car through the swirling mist. No way could it be his, however. If he'd come to see her, his car would be parked at her house. She accelerated again and pulled into her driveway, the house and car next door vanishing into the mist. The owner of the house must have finally found someone to... All at once, a person cradling a huge bouquet of red roses in one arm and gripping a white shopping bag in his other hand materialized out of the fog. It was Eric. Ten feet from the truck, he stopped and smiled. Heart racing, she fumbled with the handle, pushed the door open and slid to the ground, clinging to the edge for support. Hi. His smile broadened. W what are you doing here? Is that any way to greet your new neighbor? Her voice deserted her. A welcome to see Rose Lane would be nice. You, the word wobbled and she tried again. You rented that house? She waved toward the structure, one corner of which was now visible through the evaporating mist. Uh-huh. Why? I like the location. It has excellent proximity. To what? You. He closed the distance between them and held out the vase of flowers. If I'm going to court the most beautiful woman in Hope Harbor, I figured I'd keep the commute short. She stared into the mass of perfect crimson buds, trying to digest his news. The florist removed the thorns. You won't get hurt if you take them. I promise. A ray of sun peeked through the mist, illuminating the bouquet as she looked at him across the velvet expanse. His husky promise was for more than roses. Does this mean... Are you staying? Yes. Joy bubbled up inside her, so intense her heart began to ache. 
She took the flowers, burying her face in the sweet fragrance, trying to stem the tears brimming on her lower lashes. Hey, he nudged aside the blossoms and lifted her chin with a gentle finger. I didn't intend to make you cry. The, they're happy tears. More wisps of fog dissipated, and a few patches of blue sky appeared as she swiped her eyes on the sleeve of her t-shirt. When did you, what made you decide? Aside from the text you sent about missing me, she blinked. You mean that's part of the reason? A big part. I've gotten pretty proficient at reading between the lines during my legal career, and it wasn't hard to translate your message. But there are other reasons. He scanned the rapidly clearing sky. Why don't we continue this on the patio? I picked up a picnic dinner for us at a gourmet shop in Coos Bay on my way in. I can't think of a better place to enjoy it. Without waiting for her to respond, he took her hand, closed the truck door, and led her around the side of the house. Everything will be wet from the mist. He stopped beside the table, pulled a huge handful of paper napkins from the bag, and dried the table and chairs. The man had thought of everything. She sat, placing the bouquet on the far side of the table as he scooted his chair closer to hers and set the bag beside him. Would you like to eat or talk? I know you put in a full day of physical labor, and I'm sure you're starving. Was he kidding? Food was at the bottom of her priority list. I can wait to eat. Tell me everything. Okay, but I'll start with the most important thing. He wove his fingers through hers, his touch strong but gentle. After a lot of thought and prayer, and more sleepless nights than I care to count, I realized that losing my job was a blessing, not a disaster. It brought me back to this town, to the roots and values that shaped me. It showed me how messed up my priorities have become and reminded me of all I've given up in pursuit of my career goals. Most importantly, it led me to you. But BJ took a steadying breath and forced herself to voice her greatest fear. What if we, if we fizzle? Will you still be happy here? Will you regret changing course? I have great confidence our future will be rosy. But if I happen to be wrong, I'm not leaving. I was overdue for a course correction, and this is where I belong. She scrutinized him, searching for any sign of uncertainty, but his eyes were steady and filled with conviction. The kink in her stomach loosened. So you're gonna practice law here? Yes. She listened as he outlined his plans for expanding the scope of his legal work beyond Hope Harbor. And the best part about my new law career is that it will leave me time for my passion. Correction, my other passion. He winked at her. I haven't told anyone except my dad and Charlie, but I started painting again after I came back. I have one piece almost finished. And Charlie took it upon himself to send a photo of it to a gallery that handles some of his work. They're interested. Joy bubbled up inside her. That's wonderful, Eric. Yeah, it is, isn't it? So what will you do if the firm in Seattle offers you the position? I turned it down. Past tense? You mean they already made a decision? The recruiter called on the drive down here today. I didn't expect it to happen that fast, but I'd already made up my mind. Saying no was so easy, I knew it was the right decision. But here's the thing, BJ. He angled toward her and took both her hands, his expression solemn. I'm not gonna be making big bucks anymore. I have a nest egg from my years in Portland, but I'll be living a modest life from now on. No glamour or glitz. And unless my art takes off, I'll never be rich or have the kind of financial security I once had. She squeezed his hands and met his gaze. If I'd been after glamour or glitz or wealth, I'd have stayed in a big city. A nice little cottage to call home, 
Work that feeds my soul and someone to love is all the security I need. Then I may be your man. He rose, pulling her to her feet and into his arms. Now that I'm back in town, I'm gonna try and adopt the slower-paced Hope Harbor vibe. But there's one part of my life I wanna rev into high gear. If the lady's willing. The last tendrils of mist evaporated, and the sun warmed her face as she lifted it to smile at him. She's very willing. He tightened his grip and bent down. Her eyelids fluttered closed, and she rose on tiptoe. Just as his lips touched hers, a loud belch echoed across the water. Ah, oh, for pity's sake. Eric rested his forehead against hers, a chuckle rumbling deep in his chest. Casper needs to work on his timing. I'll say, this was so not funny. At least Eric was being a good sport about it. He backed off slightly until he could look down at her. Since we're going to be doing a lot of this on your patio, I guess we'd better get used to his rude interruptions. It's not a problem for me if I'm distracted. She snuggled closer and draped her arms around his neck. In that case, get ready for some serious distracting. Once more, Eric bent to claim her lips, and the instant he did, the rest of the world faded away. If Casper was still trying to ruin their moment, he was getting nowhere. For here in Eric's arms, nothing mattered except them, and the bright and shining future they would create together, here in Hope Harbor. Epilogue. Four months later. Get ready for an early Christmas present. The Helping Hands Board just approved the companion program. As Michael's words came over the line, tears pricked BJ's eyes. Maybe she hadn't been there for Graham, but at least she'd help give older residents in Hope Harbor an option to stay in their own home. Thank you, Lord, she thought to herself. Everything okay? A warm hand clasped hers. She nodded squeezing Eric's fingers as he swung onto Eleanor's street and guided the BMW toward the older woman's house. Thank you for letting me know right away, Michael. No problem. I knew you'd be waiting to hear. Will we see you at Eleanor's open house? I doubt it. Eric and I are pulling up now, and we're not staying long. She perused the car line street. Be prepared, though. Parking is at a premium. I think half the town is here. I'll alert Tracy to wear walking shoes. Not a bad idea. Tell her I said hi. Will do. Talk to you soon. As she tucked her phone back in her purse, Eric wedged the BMW into a tiny vacant spot. I take it the program's a go? Yes. Christmas is coming early this year. Really early. She rested her fingers on the back of his hand as he shifted into park. I got my first present the day you told me you were staying in Hope Harbor. You haven't had any second thoughts, have you? Hard as she tried to shake it, a touch of doubt nipped at her peace of mind now and then. Nope. A very wise woman once told me that to get the things we want most, we sometimes have to let go of the things that aren't as important. And what I want most is here in Hope Harbor. Even though you haven't sold any paintings yet? Painting was only part of what I wanted. The one-on-one -on -one legal work has turned out to be a lot more satisfying than I expected. I like dealing with people versus conglomerates. Plus, the thing I wanted most of all is sitting inches away and planning to spend Christmas with me. My cup is full. Moisture clouded her vision. For the record, mine is too. Nice to know. He cupped her cheek with his palm, then motioned toward the house behind them. Shall we go in before all the food is gone? Are you hungry? Always. But we also have another stop on our agenda this afternoon. What is this mystery destination anyway? It wouldn't be a mystery if I told you. Sit tight and I'll get your door. While he circled the car, she took a quick peek in the visor mirror.
Her hair was behaving. No lipstick was stuck to her teeth, and no mascara had smudged under her lashes. But hair and makeup weren't responsible for the glow on her face or the sparkle in her eyes. Those were produced by love, not L'Oreal. And one of these days, if all went as she expected, that love was going to lead to the M-word they'd both been dancing around for weeks. It couldn't happen soon enough for her. Her door opened and Eric took her hand. Once she was on her feet, he looped his arms around her waist. In case I haven't told you, you look especially beautiful today. Radiant and very kissable. His breath was a whisper of warmth against her lips. Actions speak louder than words. She gave him a playful nudge. Another car drove by, searching for a parking spot. Hold that thought for later, when we have more privacy. How much later? Depends on how long you want to stay at the party. Forty-five minutes? Half an hour? Sold. Grinning, he took her hand and led her up Eleanor's walk to the front porch, where a come in and join the party sign was taped to the front door. Eric twisted the knob and laughter, Christmas music and enticing aromas greeted them as they entered. So different from the silence and solitude that had permeated the house in pre luis days. After passing through the foyer, BJ paused on the threshold of the living room. The walls gleamed with a fresh coat of paint. The scuffs in the hardwood floor had been buffed out, and a beautiful spruce tree laden with lights and crystal ornaments occupied one corner, where Methuselah held court from under the boughs. The door opened again behind them, and BJ turned. Charlie entered, a box of Eleanor's favorite truffles in hand. Merry Christmas, you two. I hoped I'd run into you. I have news. He angled away from the crowd milling about in the living room and lowered his voice. The gallery called me an hour ago, since you asked me to handle all dealings with them. They sold the painting of the woman by the river. BJ's breath hitched, and she groped for Eric's hand. The price the gallery had put on the painting had been far beyond what either of them deemed reasonable, despite Charlie's assurance that the owner knew how to value art. Is this, are you sure? A tremor rippled through Eric's fingers. Yes, the check will be in the mail shortly. I always knew you had talent. Not that you need to sell to prove that, but it's a nice ego boost. And a boost for the bank account? Uh-huh, I figured that would make you happy, considering. The artist's eyes began to twinkle. BJ looked from him to Eric. Some kind of silent message passed between them, but before she could try to decipher it, Eleanor trundled over. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, and Merry Christmas, Charlie handed her the candy. She took it in one hand and touched his arm with the other. I'm glad you could come, Charlie. This invitation was long overdue. To everything there is a season. He rested his hand over hers for a moment, then motioned toward the dining room. Everything smells delicious. You must have been cooking for days. And loving every minute of it. But I couldn't have done it without Louise. I don't know how many times I sent the poor man to the grocery store or asked him to help me dice and chop and mix dough. Go on in and sample the results. I never pass up home cooking. As Charlie wandered toward the dining room, greeting his taco customers along the way, Eleanor set the candy on the tray of her walker and leaned in close to the two of them. I gave Luis his Christmas present this morning. What did he say? BJ tightened her grip on Eric's hand. He cried and his first concern was about leaving you in the lurch with all the new construction business that's been landing on your plate. BJ's throat thickened. That sounded like Luis, but finding a new full-time employee and allowing Luis to work part-time when his schedule permitted was a small contribution to his Christmas gift compared to the older woman's generosity. Did he accept? 
Yes. We'll finish the registration process on Monday so he can begin classes in January. After I explained his background to the nice woman at the college, I think they may waive some of the rudimentary courses. He's going to meet with them next week to discuss it. B.J. spotted Luis over Eleanor's shoulder, weaving through the crowd toward them. Here he comes, and I have some new guests to greet. Eleanor patted Eric's arm. Take this young man into the dining room and feed him after you talk with Louise. As Eleanor pushed her walker toward the foyer, Louise joined them. I hear Christmas came early for someone, BJ smiled at him. Yes, Eleanor, she is a wonderful woman, much like my grandmother. I tell her the gift is too big. She says the tuition cost is small compared to all I have done for her. Yet she has done just as much for me. His words wavered and he swallowed. I have you both to thank, too. He took her hand and gave a slight bow. I am happy to accommodate your class schedule, Louise. I wish you could practice medicine full time, but you'll be a wonderful paramedic. I am grateful to have the chance to put my medical training to use again in any way I can. I never thought it could happen. He turned toward Eric. You were right, mi amigo. I did make friends. Life did get better. And Hope Harbor is a special place. Thank you for helping me see that. As the two men shook hands, some silent communication passed between them. Interesting. They must have bonded somewhere along the way. Once Luis moved on, Eric tapped his watch. You want to grab some food so we can head out? Eat and run, hmm? I have plans for the rest of the day. He propelled her toward the dining room. They nibbled at the buffet, chatted with Reverend Baker and Father Kevin, who arrived together spoke briefly to a few other residents as they worked their way back toward the front door and said their goodbyes to Eleanor and Luis. Once outside, Eric took her hand. Nice party. Not that we stayed long. She waved to Lexi, who was approaching Eleanor's house from across the street. She looks a lot different in civvies, doesn't she? Yeah. Eric spared the striking woman no more than a distracted glance and kept walking. What's with you today? What do you mean? He hit the auto lock button on his keychain, hurrying her along. You seem kind of on edge. I'm, uh, still thinking about the news from the gallery. That came out of the blue. I knew it was only a matter of time. Those first sketches you did for the backdrop were proof you had talent. She waited beside the car while he opened her door. This has been a day for great news, hasn't it? The companion program was approved, you sold your first painting, and Luis is back on track to work in the medical field again. She slid inside and smiled up at him. How could this holiday season get any better? T minus 10 and counting. As Eric flipped on the BMW blinker, BJ's earlier comment echoed in his mind. If everything went the way he hoped, this holiday season was about to get much better. Is there a road here? BJ leaned forward in the passenger seat and inspected the wooded shoulder. Yes, barely. Eric swung onto a faint two-lane gravel track that led into the woods. Two hundred feet in, the trees thinned to reveal a spectacular view of the coast, the tall grass at the edge of the bluff dancing in the wind. Wow, BJ leaned forward to take in the scene. Once he stopped the car, she jumped out without waiting for him to open her door and jog toward the view. What a gorgeous panorama. H how did you find this spot? Charlie's house isn't far from here. Eric strolled up beside her. He told me about it. If we hadn't already eaten, this would be a great spot for a private picnic. Or something more. He fingered the small square box in the pocket of his slacks. 
T minus five and counting. Take a look at this. He drew her to the far side of the bluff where a trail wound down to a small private beach. How cool is that? Should we go down? That was my plan. Part of it anyway. They descended the rocky forested incline, emerging onto the sand in a tiny sheltered cove. Here, the wind that had buffeted them on the bluff was nothing more than a gentle breeze. BJ crossed the sand to where the water lapped gently against the shore, scanned the long expanse of horizon, and sighed. I think I could live here. The perfect opening. Heart pounding, he dug out the box, flipped up the lid, and moved beside her. I was hoping you'd feel that way. Because this land is for sale and I'd like to build a house on it to share with you. She swung toward him, eyes rounding when she spotted the ring. Is this, are you proposing? I'm getting ready to. Yes, he blinked. I didn't ask yet. Whoops, she clapped a hand over her mouth. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. Go ahead. It's kind of irrelevant now. He grinned and pulled the marquee-shaped stone out of the box. No way. She hooked her hands together behind her back and shook her head. I want to hear your proposal. Most women only get this chance once, and I intend to savor every minute of it. She wasn't letting him off the hook. His pulse picked up speed again. Putting your heart on the line was way tougher than presenting a high-stakes closing argument even when you already knew the outcome. But he had his speech prepared, if he could remember it. Okay, here goes. He took her hand, twined their fingers together, and held on tight as he plunged in. During my career in law, I've learned to present facts in a way that sways the judge and jury to my position. So here are the facts in this case. Since the moment we met, Every day has brought new questions and new doubts about the path I'd laid out for myself and the priorities I'd set. But through it all, one thing became more and more clear. I didn't want to live my life without the most wonderful woman I'd ever met. He stroked his thumb over the back of her hand and focused on her beautiful face. I'm not the best bargain, BJ. Hope Harbor has a mellowing effect, but I'm a type A personality and will probably always work too hard, whether it be at law or painting. On the flip side, I'll also work hard to be a great husband. I may not be able to offer you trips to Paris every year or designer clothes and expensive jewelry on your birthday, but I can offer you my love for the rest of my life. He positioned the ring at the tip of her finger. So will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? She opened her mouth, but when no words came out, she resorted to a nod. He slipped the ring over her finger and gestured to the land around them. Welcome home, BJ. All at once, faint creases dented her brow. But isn't this property outrageously expensive? It's on the pricey side. However, Charlie knows the owner and got me an excellent deal. It'll eat up most of the nest egg I accumulated, but as Charlie pointed out, coastal property at a moderate price is always a smart investment. As for the house, I know a talented architect who could design an amazing one with a studio for me and an office for her. She might even waive the fee if there are fringe benefits. What kind of fringe benefits? A teasing light began to dance in her eyes, chasing away her frown. Shall I demonstrate? By all means. But first, can I tell you something? Always. I think I'm the one coming out ahead on this deal. How so? I get you. A swoon-worthy guy who's generous, kind, smart, funny caring, romantic, and trustworthy, who pitches in whenever and wherever he's needed, 
who walked, or should I say, crashed into my life one day and changed it forever, for the better, who makes me feel like the sun is shining even on cloudy days. Her final words quivered with emotion and pressure built in his throat. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, she cuddled closer. About that demonstration. Coming right. A loud belch offshore. He groaned. Don't tell me. BJ squinted at the silver white seal perched on a small outcrop of rock. Do you think, could that possibly be Casper? Stranger things have happened, I guess. And to tell you the truth, at this point, it would feel odd if he didn't show up at amorous moments. Maybe he's lonely and our romance gives him a vicarious thrill. In that case, let's give him the thrill of a lifetime. Unless you have any objection. Nope. The defense rests. Smiling, he tugged her close again. This woman who'd managed to transform his world, who'd shown him that love trumped high-profile litigation any day, whose caring heart and compassionate nature added grace and beauty and joy to his days. And as their lips melded, as the world around them melted away, he gave thanks for happy endings and for Hope Harbor's everyday miracles that made life good and sweet.